Welcome to the Sorch Podcast, where we explore Sikh and wider South Asian history, art, and philosophy with historians, artists, and researchers. Today I have the pleasure, and to be honest, I am very excited to talk to Kamalpreet Singh Pardesi. He's the genius behind GurmukVachar.com and a plethora of translations of Vedantic and Sikh texts. Before we get stuck in, into what is Vedant, I just want to get to know more about yourself. So, like, how did you end up in this country, your family's kind of migration patterns, um, what led you into what it is you're doing um just yeah just kind of like how did you end up where you are today thank you very much for having me on here um i i think you've probably run out of guests to be quite honest to get not down to me um well with regards to coming into the the country and family migrations i was born here um first generation here my parents have come from india and africa their background is um Basically, dad's family comes from uh, Ladiana, close to uh, what is Rara Saheb now, Karam Sargordora. My dad's family, their background is actually from a Radha Swami family. So they were Radha Swamis up until my dad's generation, and my dad and his five brothers, then as Radha Swamis initially born into a Radha Swami house, um, met Santisha Singhji Radha Saheb Wali. Uh, once they had met them, obviously they came into Gurmat, took their Amrit and became Gursiks. And then my mum's family, uh, completely different, uh, I can say. My grandfather was born in uh, India. My grandmother was born in Burma. And uh, they had the unfortunate task of um, having to migrate at the outbreak of the uh, the war. At the outbreak of the First World War, uh, they had to migrate across from Burma. They were really rich in Burma at the time. You know, she even says when she was a child, she used to be playing with gems. While we're sitting here, you know, thinking, oh, my God, you know, she was, we had Rolls Royces, they had servants, they had all sorts. And they said when the war broke out, they took everything with them from Burma to the, um, the, the country line to get into India, up until the border. Then at the border, all the Burmese told them that they can leave and go into India, but they had to leave everything behind. They had to hand over everything, and they had everything taken off them on there. Uh, at the border at the time, so all their wealth, everything was gone. They walked back into India and made their way to Punjab. And then my grandfather and grandmother on my mother's side, they ended up in Africa. My my grandfather was somebody on the day of partition working as a... Um, he was working on the railways in Pakistan. And uh, he got on a train all the way back to Punjab, and he was the only survivor on that train. From there, you know, my grandfather, grandmother got out to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. My grandfather works for B, um, British Telecom, and that's how they ended up in the UK. And so he got he got transferred here into Leicester to work in British Telecom here with um, the rest of the family coming. And obviously, my my mother's family knew my father's family from when they migrated from Africa back to India for a bit, and they knew the family in Bombay. Mumbai. Um, so that's how they ended up getting married. And I was born born here in 1980 in Leicester, Leicester based and always been Leicester based, to be honest. With you. That's incredible. I've got so many questions off the back of that. You, you mentioned, obviously, that your grandmother was f- originally from Burma. I just wanted to find, like, I just wanted to ask, would, do you know how your grandma and that side of the family ended up in Burma in the first place? No, absolutely not. That's the, that's the problem. We have, you know, it, it's one of those sore stories. Like, I guess we never wanted to dredge up. We know from our parents that obviously my grandmother's background was from Burma. She, you know, we've been told that they had land, they had wealth, they had all sorts when they were in Burma, and they had to leave everything behind at the war. So it's, it's one of those that you want to know about, but you fear dredging up those sorts of points in their in their life that was full of hardship. So we never brought it up, but. She, would mention she would just mention it on the off chance that that's where they were from, and then they came into the UK. Oh, sorry, went into India, uh, and then they ended up. You know, my grandma's family all towards the high court where Guru Gobind Singh Ji um, uh, pulled up, uprooted the um, the plants after they heard about the service. That's where they ended up remaining after that. But no, with regards to Burma, and we've always thought about it. it's because we're like there should be some paperwork somewhere for land riches text but obviously during the war it would have been gone as well looking at modern day modern day burma or what is myanmar now isn't it it's all over the place but yeah so that that's we, we've got as many questions as you probably have to be honest thing. 
Yeah, no, I couldn't well imagine. It's interesting because the riches and the wealth that the commu- that the Sikh community had before, or Punjabi community had before migrating into the UK, and obviously through, due to the turmoil of the kind of the First World War, Second World War, and what that unleashed, it's nuts. It's 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 quite incredible. You mentioned that your grandfather had got a job with BT, and that is what brought you all into the UK. So just just like correct me if I'm wrong here, did he then like did he apply for the job in the UK, or was it a job out like in Kenya or something? Like how did all of that come to fruition? Basically, the family all lived in Dar es Salaam. My mum was born in Dar es Salaam when they were there in the fifties. So every now and then he'd they'd end up working either in Dar es Salaam or back in India. But he he ended up with a government post working for British Telecom out there. So what they were doing was they were you know how you see the old films where they were connecting uh, calls from country to country. That's what they were doing. And then obviously he was offered a position while the British still had control of uh, Tanzania, Dar es Salaam. That obviously there was a position going here in the UK. They also had um, friends who were living in the UK. So it wasn't even a case that my grandfather came here to work, but prior to him even coming to the UK, he got all the money together to send my grandmother, uh, his four daughters and two sons, and he remained in Africa for uh, another additional year with another two of his sons, because my mum comes from a massive family with three sisters and four brothers. Um, in order to pay for that. So he had to borrow the money to send everybody first. And then he could take the uh, the job in the UK after that. So initially, he sent everybody on a task. You know, my grandmother's come to the UK. She, up until the, the day she passed away, couldn't put a sentence together in English. Ended up having to come and stay with friends for a year and whatnot. And so my grandfather made it over here. So, you know, you look back at those times, I look at some of my kids and they get a bit anxious about going somewhere they don't know and these lot were going across the world but they had no idea where they were going or what they were doing yeah that's very true and on top of it the the communication and like the connectivity that we have today just obviously didn't exist then exactly exactly because they were going because they used to go from africa to india by ship so they were doing two weeks on a ship you know, in two weeks back, that's how they were, they were traveling at the time. So you can imagine now where we've got phones and everything and they still have a bit of apprehension about everything. And at the time, my mom just said they can remember coming here as kids because, you know, they ended up going to school here and learning everything here. But, you know, they'd never seen snow before. They'd never seen half these things before. They'd never seen blonde hair before, let alone anything else. But, yeah, he came, he got given a job working on the um, uh, switchboards. And that's how he ended up in Leicester. There was a job with BT, BT's British Telecom. That's insane. I, I love this part of the podcast because everyone has a very it's almost like a movie-esque story everyone has like the fact it's never quite as simple as like yeah they went from x to y there's always something in there and it's just it's amazing just to just to talk about it um just then moving that slightly further on how did you then end up in the research and the work that you're doing at the moment and then how did that lead to kind of goodman vajard and everything that you're currently working on it's difficult to say um, i was on um Amadeep Singh's, uh, not podcast, but we had an Instagram chat the other week and he asked me the same thing. But basically me coming into Sikhi, I was born into a Sikh household. But like every other person who's born into Sikh household, it's just something you do. It's not something you you look at and, and admire or consider it to be of relevance. You just, I'm born as a Sikh, I'm a Sikh on Punjabi. But as a kid, I was a, I was a little thief, basically. I used to pickpocket, you know, we, we did come from an affluent background. My mom and dad worked every hour of every day. They put shirts on our backs rather than their own. They did everything for us. But still, as a kid, you you, you see the 10p suites or whatever it was at the time, and you, you take that 10p, you take the 20p. I was such a chore up until the point that my my nana, my grandpa, they had a uh, Maharaja Prakash at their house. So the, the good grandpa, which I'd brought back from, from India years ago, it was a Lodi Vastu. And I was such a thief that up until the age, you know, so five or six, I'd go upstairs and I'd take the the 2p or the 5p that had been put there when somebody had done mutter. So I was a thief, basically, and um, obviously got caught a number of times because as a kid, you're not very savvy in how you do things. And when you turn up with about 10p in your pocket when you shouldn't have, they know it's not theirs. Got got the got the beatings as needed. And um, basically, parents spoke to me a number of times, said, look, this is getting out of hand. And uh, we'll take you to uh, a sadhu. So uh, we end up in front of the sadhu. That's what happened. And um, like I was telling you, I'm saying it was a case of, I, I, you know, my parents said, look, this is what's happened. In the way he is now, he's getting out of hand and he's already started to steal. And he's at a young age. Not just stealing, but then lying about stealing. 
So I ended up there, and then literally the the sergeant turned to me and said, "You know, your parents have dealt with this, but next time you do this, we'll deal with it ourselves." And, uh, and like I said on, on on these things chat as well, I was saying. What I saw then, they obviously didn't see, but I, the form that was presented in front of me of the Sardo just grew and grew. And that was it. My life changed from that moment. It literally did because we got downstairs from after seeing that Sardo. I picked up my first book, which was the um, the Bedtime Stories of Good World and Sinji. You know, the little, that was my first book I picked up. I must have been six or seven years old. And that was it. I read that from cover to cover within the day. And it was just that, that conversation with that Sardo, that what I saw, what I felt, that changed my life from there. And a smart grew then. Uh, but only to the point where I wanted to, uh, you know, I had the Amrachitra comics, which I think you, you, yeah, I had all of those as a kid, every single one. Whether it was about Sikhi or the Mahabharata, things like that, I read all them. So, you know, I got into Sikhi then until we ended up then age 11 going on a plane. Yeah, we ended up on a plane to India. First time I was going to India that I can remember. I remember, you know, I went there when I was too young. I was two years old uh, prior to that. So 11 years old, we were on a plane. I'm sat next to my dad and my brother on the other side, who's younger than me. And my dad said to me, he goes, um, what, you know, when we get to India, what do you want to see? What do you want to do? And it was the first moment I had where I actually thought to myself, well, what do I want to see? And I... You know, as a child, you, every Sunday you're at the Gurdwara. We were at the Gurdwara whenever any Kathakars or anybody came um, to the Gurdwara. And obviously we grew up in the 80s. So in the 80s, all you saw was uh, pictures of 84, San Janel, Sinji, the Shaheeds. Whether I knew anything about them or not was a different thing. But I think San Janel, Sinji, as a child, stood out because you're looking at somebody very similar to when you see the depictions of Sri Guru Gorban, Sinji, where you've got an individual here who's carrying arms. And as a kid, and as a as a kid, as a young lad, all you're watching is your GI Joes and your, your cartoons, where it's that sort of thing, or you're you're trying to beat your brother up playing Karate Kid all day. <laughs> so you do as kids. So I remember on the plane, I just said to my dad, I said, um, I want to see Pindarawali, and my dad just covered my mouth and told me to be quiet, not realizing it's 1981, not realizing why. And uh, I said, just I looked at my dad and said, what, what's happening? He said, they're dead. Uh, and for me, that was a big moment. I was like, "As he did, he's got a black beard. He's looked, he's young. He did, uh, you know." And I, I couldn't fathom or grasp what was going on or why my dad said that. And I couldn't understand at the time why my dad had covered my mouth as well. Uh, and obviously, because of uh, the stuff that was going on in India with the card calls still going on, San Janelson is still being considered a terrorist and, and all sorts, you know. Um, and that was it. When I got back, it was only when we got back to the UK. Obviously, on the way back to the bend, my dad told me what had happened and they'd been killed by the army and this and that. And when I got back to the UK at the age of 11, I started walking into town uh, and going into the different libraries in Leicester and at the Gordoras and finding any sort of thing to do with Operation Blue Star and San Janel Sinji. That was a start. I'd say, and from that it grew, you know, uh, I, um, my dad was, because they had spent their time with Santi Shasinji Rarasavani, his thing was whenever there was a sadhu around or a santh around or a kathagar around, we were going to go to the Gurdara. Whether we as kids were going to listen or not was a different thing because we were outside running around. But from that point, I started reading and then you know, uh, I wanted to know more. And then age 12, Good Nanak Seat College opened in London. We ended up being the first ones there. We were there when there was like 30 people there. It hadn't even started as a school. And it was it was great because it was not just me. It was all my cousins there. There was 22 of us. There was 22 of us there. Um, so then all of a sudden you're around Sikhs at the age of 12 years old. And you're talking about things that you've never spoken about. 1984 was a big thing. Uh, the lives of different sadhus, um, how to do Simran, you know, things like that. And it just, it just grew and grew. And then... By the time I hit 16, I was listening to different sadhus. 17 was the first time I listened to any Mahapurk and thought, I don't understand what's going on here because you're talking about things that I can't even understand in Punjabi. When they started talking about your chakras and your dust and and then, like I said, at that same age, I had the, the opportunity of being around some, some good Guru Sikhs who still 
really prominent with uh, Vachar Kamaru Singh, obviously, you know him. Uh, Thira Singh Nimrala was a massive you know, influence on my life and still is. I'm still you know, in contact with him. Uh, Michael G. Singh from Leicester, who's in Seeks to Inspire. I grew up with him. His dad was one of my teachers. So being around good individuals just allowed me to have those conversations that you wouldn't normally have with other people. Because it is because of that that you get to that point where you're just like, well, I want to know more and want to know more. Started off with, I wanted to know more about history. And then my, you know, I, I knew what I wanted to know about history. It was I want to know about myself more than anything. And that's where things went into Nirmal studies, Nihang studies, going into the Sampradas, which, and then the other thing I had was, I do it now as part of my job, but I used to listen to Katha. I used to go to the Gurdwara and take a big boom box because that, that's all I had a big, big like audio tape player. I used to take that with me and I used to record the Gutha as bad as the audio was and background was. I used to record the Gutha because as I found at that age, I'd listen to a bit of Gutha, 40 minute Gutha, I'd retain about 30 seconds of it, only the bit that I found interesting. I used to go back uh, and listen to the tapes at home. If I didn't understand it, I'd ask my dad what that meant. I'd ask my, you know, I'd ask somebody what that meant. And uh, I started making notes. Um, but yeah, what happened was I ended up with a, a load and load, a load of tapes and audio. And somebody uh, in Canada, Godmouth which I was started by a, an individual by the name of Amdeep Singh, who lives out in Canada. And the site had just come online in early 2000. And he'd put a couple of recordings on. So I contacted him at the time about one or two recordings I had, which I sent over. And at the same time, my um, my star, I, I attached myself to some, some projects at the time because I liked their style of gutha. One was Santari Singh Randhari Because his gutha is, the way he talks, the way he puts everything across is like talking to your, your normal, ordinary individual that you find in Nipin. It is, you know... The normal Punjabi, there's nothing uh, difficult about it and everything's explained in such a, a manner that anybody can understand. But he had come to Leicester, and in Leicester, like in every other Gurdwara, you had a little shop where they were selling all the tapes, CDs or books or whatever they could at the time. And he saw a couple of his own tapes there. And he just looked at me and said, "What? you know, it's got my picture on it. What are these? And said, they're your audio tapes, so you've, got to, you've done it different Gurdwaras. And he looked at me and he said, how much are they? And at the time, you know, I asked, are they £1.50 each for, for a tape? And uh, I remember some of these things, he's just looking at me, he goes, uh, right, okay, your, um, your duty now is to find a way to put Gutha uh, in some form somewhere uh, so that people can get it for free and don't have to pay this £1.50, don't have to pay this money. And that's what he said. He just said, Gutha should not be... He goes, we perform it live on, on stage for people to listen to, for people to make money off. So he said, your duty now, until, until your prana goes, until your um, life force goes, yeah, this is it, this is what you'll be doing. And 20 years on, I'm still doing it, unfortunately. You know, I was hoping that the prana would go before that, but they're still, they're still here at the moment. So yeah, that, basically, that's how it started. And uh, it, it was interesting because I brought them around to my house at the side of my parents' house. And I played them Master Darshan Singh uh, Namtari, his uh, Ucharan of uh, the Ugardanti, and the Savanya before that, because I said, look, is this Shud? So we put it on, and it starts with Billy Bidram uh, you know, which goes into the David G. Hughes and, um, and they listened to it, and they went, yeah, Shud, it's fine. And they're like, well, where are we listening to this from? Because they'd come, you know, 2000, not really use the internet in India at all. And I said, look, it's over the internet. And, got there. and that's what I said. I said, right, and I said, we talked to you about the tapes. This is what you do. You put it on the internet to find a way to put it on here. And uh, I didn't know. I didn't know the first coup. And this, you know, Amandeep Singh in Canada was happy to take all the audio at the time. He, he must have got fed up with me because I was constant, constantly on it. And uh, my Raja Kippur, he just went, here you go. Here's the, here's the FTP access. Here's all the details. Here's the security codes. Um, it's now yours. You, you know, he, the website is still his. He pays for it because I said to him, I'll give you the money, whatever. He pays for it, it's still his. But all the content and everything that uh, is being put up is 
being put up by myself, but it doesn't mean that the content is mine. Good six from all over the world. Contact me to this day. I had somebody today contact me about 750 recordings. You know, they're just coming from everywhere. So, yeah, there's, we just want to make it basically, like I said to you, when, when we were 11, 12, even up to 16, 17, you know, we were running around trying to get books, trying to get a gutter tape and sharing the tape and giving the audio to somebody else. We wanted the next generation to have a platform available where they don't have to do that, where everything is there and, and, you know, and they can just go on there, list it, and, you know, technology has advanced so great, you know, that everybody has got the internet no matter what part of the world they're in. And on that, on that um, uh, app itself, on the website itself, there's so much gutter on there that you'll never be able to listen to it from start to finish. Yeah, true. It's, it's, it's literally a treasure trove. One thing that I find really quite interesting, just, just from when you were talking, is that like you were describing your childhood. And to be honest, if I played what you were saying to my parents, they probably would have thought that you were talking about me because very similarly, I, w- like, I wasn't necessarily a thief, although I did. I remember stealing like £2.50 off my grandma because I, I'd watched a... I think there was an advert on TV for like some remote controlled car. And I was like, yeah, I want that. So still to this day, I can't figure out why I thought £2.50 was going to buy at me. But I was yeah, I was getting in trouble left, right and center. I got suspended three times before I did my GCSEs. I was a bright student in that I was getting A's and B's and whatever. But I had teachers basically calling my parents every other day. Similarly with yourself, my parents were like, look, we've done everything we can. We don't know what else to do with you. Like many people, I think from any Punjabi generation, there's always that threat that if you don't behave, we're going to send you back to Punjab. Or in my case, it was like, they're going to send you to Bodo Um And I, I don't know if you ever had the pleasure to meet him, but there was a Mahpush from, I think he was originally from Dudley, uh, called Baba Ranjit Singh. And he would come to our house like constantly, constantly, constantly. And Is that... Is that by um, uh, Bob Ranjit Singh Child of Year? Is that him? I don't think so. No, no. He, it was. No, from Dudley. No. Nah. Yeah, uh, I, I can't remember what. I'd have to ask my dad in, in terms of like the further information. But um, in a similar vein, my mom basically cried to him one day and was like, my, my son doesn't behave. He doesn't do anything. He's getting in trouble at school. They want to basically kick him out. And uh, Babaji was like, yeah, bring him here and I'll talk to him. And. To this day, it makes me uh, kind of well up slightly because he turned around to me and goes, look, don't worry about every, what everyone else is doing. All you need to do is read. Just go and read. And, I, and at that point in time, I didn't quite understand what he meant, but I was like, fine. And similarly with yourself, literally that same day, life kind of changed where, where before my parents were like, you need to be revising and doing your work. I was actually now picking up my books, going out of my way to actually do what it was that I needed to do. So it's kind of almost like made the hairs on my back of my neck stand up to when you were talking because it was i was like what the parallels are so like are so interesting yeah but you you see you see that in you know when you look back at it similar to yourself we both went through a similar sort of situation and it's quite frightening you know when you think back and you think man how much I, i must have nicked some money from here some from here some from here and you you worry about well i do i know i do i worry about merely cook it to the end i'm Right. And then you read the stories of Pai Adan, uh, what's it, Pai Billy going to Pai Adelizi, and he had, he had done the same, and you think to yourself, if Manaj is such a good Palu, they'll, they'll, they'll look after me. I'd still have to give a lick her, but it's amazing how just the words of a Gursik, in the way that Pai Adelizi did with Pai Billy there, and took him to Sri Guru Arjun Devji at the time, it's amazing how the words of a Gursik can, can affect your life very quickly. Completely, completely. And I think uh, just another little personal anecdote, which makes me laugh to this day, you were, you, you were just commenting about the words of a Mahpush. In this case, it was just a laugh of a Mahpush. Um, there was a Mahpush, again, unfortunately, he passed away uh, from the physical realm, so to speak, and like, I think like 10 years ago. Um, his name was Baba Arjun Singhji from Birmingham. He would spend six months in Birmingham and then spend six months back in India in, in, in his bind. Um, and his his like story of becoming a Mahpush and, and, and kind of enlightenment, so to speak, is, is really interesting. But um, we would go and see him and he, he never, he would be really loving and kind to children, but he would like, he wouldn't really um, have a conversation with you, if that makes sense. So he'd obviously be talking with the parents or whatever. 
And he was talking to my mom and dad and I was sat somewhere in the back and he was like, he, he was like, yeah, come here. And to put it into context, the first time we met him, we were taught, my grandma was talking to him and she was talking about uh, their house in Africa. And this is the first time they've met. So there's never, they've never talked. And Babaji said, bring me a piece of paper and a pen. So they obviously gave it to him and Babaji sat there and then drew the outline of the house that they owned in Kenya on the paper and goes, yeah, you guys lived here. This was your neighbor. This is where your gate was and whatever the like the, the, the girl was for that situation. It, it is amazing, isn't it? I, I, you know, I can, I can give you, this is why I believe in there are sadhus there. Uh, the one Sikhi show talks about in Gurbani anyway. But when you see things happen, my dad was, I was 15, yeah, 15 years old. So 15 years old, I wanted to take my mom with my parents again. Now you're not going to take, sorry, 16 years old. My parents saying, you're not taking my mom with because we're about to go to college and we know what you're going to do. You're going to do the same as everybody else and piss about and do this and do that. And I thought, oh God, okay, right, that's fine. My dad at the time was suffering that he had a curved spine. Um, some of his discs were out of place. He had gone to the doctor's. And the doctors just said, unfortunately, this is going to be there for the rest of your life. You're not going to be able to sit or stand without pain. So um, we had a Mahaprabhu come down to Leicester. We had actually, there were three of them here at the time, and they're all at the same house. So we ended up there. And like I said, we ended up there. Sadhu looked straight at me the first time I sat with him. And he said, uh, so are you, uh, you ready to take your home? And obviously it's, it's a question that neither of us have brought or nobody said anything. I said, well, yeah, but my parents are saying, you know, not to take it. And my dad was sat there, and he, my dad had really gone there to say, look, my back's hurting, how do I do this, how do I sort myself out? And then I looked at my dad and said, look, your mother's passed away earlier on this year, but prior to her passing away, she promised to go to Hujul Sahib and do this seva, and that's fallen on you. So uh, they said to my dad, and they said to my younger brother and myself, they said, take your umrah tomorrow, fly out to Hujul Sahib within the week, go and do this seva for a week there, and you'll be fine. My dad said at the time, because... I can barely walk now. How am I supposed to get to Hajul Sahib? And I said, the moment you take your own with, you'll be fine. You know, we, we took our own with the next day, three mile per kit within the Panch Piyari. Panch Piyari, the Sari, We took our own with, my dad was fine, we flew out, you know, and he came back to England after, after the seva that we did out there. Went back to, you know, we were at the hospital, they did all the checks on his spine and everything, and they, they even said, they said, we don't, what have you done? Where have you? what specialists have you seen? But I've not seen any. I've, I've been to India, went to the temples and came back. And they said, that can't be right. You had curvature in your spine. Three of your discs were displaced. You were supposed to be like this for the rest of your life. How have you done this? And, and you know, when you see things like that, you're like, there's no, I can't explain this to somebody who doesn't either have any shardha or doesn't believe in it. Somebody's going to this today and go, actually, I think what he's saying is bullshit. You know, that. If they don't, if they haven't experienced it, they haven't seen it. They will. They'll just go. He's talking shit. There's no way. That happened. You know, it's it's that sort of thing. It's, so I, I think the moment you experience something, or the moment you have what they consider to be clear positivity, which is what I'd say either you and myself or had or the, at that point where you meet that gursik and they they do I don't know what they do give you that divine grace, and then all of a sudden you start picking up books, you start doing things, and your life sort of changes within a moment. Yeah, no, definitely. And and again, just just like how you were saying about these Mahapush, Baba Arjun Singh Ji. So we had, through the work Dad does, he's got a friend who's a doctor. And this doctor, like very well to do, worked in all these different businesses and whatever. He's got a medical background. He did that for a while. And then anyway, he ended up with liver disease. And he went to the doctor and the doctor was like, basically, your liver is 70% damaged. And uh, you have, you've essentially got about two years left to live, best case scenario. And at the time, he was probably, I don't know, maybe 35-ish, between 30 and 40. So like not old by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and he obviously went to all the experts. He knew everyone and whatever, and and no one could, could help him. They were like, yeah, basically, this is like end of, like, this is terminal. And he just happened once to bring it up in a, in a business meeting with, with my dad. And my dad goes, give me a second. Do you mind if I call someone in India? And the doctor goes, the, like the guy who's got the liver disease, turned around and goes, like, what, like, what's he gonna do? And and dad goes, trust me. Do you mind if I ask him? And he goes, all right, go for it. So he rings Babaji in India and he goes, Babaji, like, this is the situation. Can you help? Babaji goes, give me five minutes, and I'll ring you back. 
So what they normally like, I'm sure you're more than aware than than most. But like Babaji basically then went into like meditative state. Whatever had happened in that state, I don't know. Rang dad back and and goes, can you ask the doctor? Was he on a plane at this day at this time? And did he drink something in the plane? So dad goes, dad goes, obviously repeats it, and the doctor's face goes blank. I mean, like white, tear like paper white. And he goes, how does your mate in India know this? He goes, yeah. He goes, that's exactly what happened. And he goes, and then, and then dad, so obviously dad repeats over the phone and Babaji goes, after he got off that plane, did he feel unwell and whatever, whatever? And he goes, and he obviously asked and he goes, yeah. And Babaji obviously then tells dad, he's like, he needs to go and do X, Y, and Z, Siva, do this and that, and, and he'll be fine. Doctor goes and does it, livers back to normal. He goes and gets it checked out. And again, just like you were saying, all of the experts are like, where have you gone? Who who have you seen? What treatment have you been given? And it's just, and you just, again, as you're saying, unless you experience it, I think it's slightly difficult to accept it. Exactly. Exactly. No, I've, I've, like I said, I've seen many of those. My, my uh, muscle fell off a, a, a ladder, broke his back. You know, he... He completely, completely fine. He's working again. He's a builder. He's doing whatever, you know. But at the time, they said he'd never walk again. You know, it's just simple things. My, you know, my cousins are, had gluten intolerance all their life. Follow the button of Mahabharat and all of a sudden, she's cleared of being gluten free. I've never known anybody to sort themselves out and get off gluten intolerance. Her brother-in-law is a, um, um, a far, involved in pharmacy, and he just, you know, I can remember him, him asking her again, "What? Tell me again. What do the doctors say? How, what do you mean that you're not?" intolerance of gluten but it's simple, little things like that and i know somebody might say they're medical anomalies or might say whatever but for people like me it grows shudder grows blame grows and you sort of realize actually there's there's something there i think just just to add to that before we we move on to, um i think for me personally what i find quite amazing with these kind of experiences or instances is actually kind of it it lends credence to the entire enlightenment process so if we were to simplify it and say for argument's sake that the gurus were at the absolute apex of complete enlightenment then these marpushes if we were to create into a hierarchy are are on that trajectory at some point somewhere which if we were you or I or anyone else to sit down and do our Nam Simran, we too can follow that path. And I think experiencing that really brings that to the forefront. Yeah, without a doubt. You, you realize that it's an experience and you can reach that ideal. You can reach that, reach that plateau. You know, when it says, it says it within Gurbani, and, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about it, like, you know, just the, the vox of Har Har Jandoyeka, Bibichara Kuchinahi, Jalte, Jitarang Jiyo, Jali Bika Swai. You know, that, that's what it's stating there. But, between the the holy man and God, or between the holy gems, basically those people who spend their time doing that book, you can get to that level. There's no difference between them, you know, and and that's what you can do. And you can see that these people who have gone through that experience and work, you know, had, had that grace upon them from previous karma or whatever, they can get there, and they can still perform these things and say these things today that uh, assist other people. Definitely, definitely. All right, so I know we, we slightly digressed, but this is why I enjoy these conversations. So we obviously mentioned that a, a lot of the texts are Vedantic by nature. Now, I would just like to know, and I'm sure other people listening would like to know, what do we mean when we're talking and when we say Vedant and how is that necessarily different or complementary to Sikhi? Like, how does it all fit in? Right. Let me, let me think. Uh, Vedant, I'd say if, if you were to talk about Vedant today, um, I think, I think I spoke to yourself and you're asking whether it's similar to modern day philosophers. Was that correct? Was that yourself saying? Yeah. So I was asking if, because what the little, the little bit that I know is that there are six traditional schools of Indian thought. Yes, yeah. And so what I assumed was Vedant in, in, in kind of a, a, a macro scale is those six different schools. Um, because it's in, it's, I think it's in Radas as well, where yeah, it's, sure, it's sure, 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 where Keith and Solak comes in, doesn't it? Yeah, sorry, Keith and Solak. So yeah. that, that's literally the little bit that I'm aware of. Yeah. Um, but obviously, please, please expand. Now, really, what people, when they talk about Vedanta, they talk about Vedanta as being a, a philosophy. Um, and if we were to compare it to Western philosophers, um, let's say, such as Descartes or somebody like that, or Plato, the issue you have is it's like comparing sociology and psychology, where you have two different studies that explain the perspectives of behavior from two different viewpoints. And Vedanta is basically a viewpoint on on God, like the Chekar Chekar Shev, there's Guru Rekha 
this is again just to like expand a little bit further when you're talking when so when we're talking about western philosophers they're normally differentiated by the fact that they're based on like reason logic um it's trying to like argue kind of reductionist um descartes obviously i think therefore i am is completely in opposition to gurbani because technically the i is the the bit that stops you from realizing your ultimate form what we get with western philosophy is deductive reasoning and it's done through life and intellectual reasoning so vedant also does the same it has deductive reasoning but it also goes on to use philosophy along with religious experience and religious faculty so the eastern vedantic thought is found elsewhere as well but it's more prominent there so the example like you said there you know you get the um, they they can't work so kagito i go some which is i think therefore i am it causes dualism so you get duality because basically you're saying that the mind and body are separate um so they're using deductive reasoning constantly in order to go further but they're not using any anything to do with their senses or religious teaching so you get further you get that neutral uh, monism with uh, spinoza who states that actually the mind and body are the same they are the same. and then you get rousseau who goes further and says actually he goes into moral ethics very much like Mencius and Confucius, where the standard of ethics is fundamentally within everybody. So, you know, Mencius says that we're all born without any sort of behavior, but we all realize what is right and wrong. So he goes, even if you're a three-year-old kid to a 70-year-old child, whether you have got um, some hatred in your heart, if you were to see a baby walk and fall into a well, everybody would go and try to help that child without knowing who that child is or anything like that. So we're all fundamentally good. There's, there's a reason there. Now, Vedant itself is a school of philosophy that transcends ethical, moral, and religious philosophy. So it covers dualism, monism, uh, pantheism. It covers all sorts of things. I'll, I'll break everything down if you want. Um, you know, but it's, its views are very similar to uh, Christianity and Gnosticism, um, Sufi schools of thought. Uh, the Ismailis and people like that. So, whereas uh, it's it's more, if you were to look at Western philosophy and you look at pantheism, where all things are seen as an aspect of an all-embracing personal God. So that's that's what Vedanta really is. But then we look at what Sikhi's view is. Sikhi's view is a, a panantheism, which is a, everything is part of God, but God is higher and He is sentient. So he is, he is a uh, Chetan Sarup, but that's what he says in Goodbye in your time. So everything else is just an expansion of God. When you say Chetan Sarup, what it does that, what would the best translation of that be? Well, when you get the Chetan Sarup, well, basically you get, um, when they talk about God and Maya, they say there's five things there's, there's Sat, Chet, Anand, uh, Rup, and Nam. So they say Rup and Nam. Rup is your form and your name. These are Maya because these are changing. So when you get a Sargon form of God, um, these two are added, but obviously the form changes constantly and the name changes because it can be, obviously if they come in a Sargon form, they're a child one minute, then they're a toddler, then there's somebody else, then they're a husband. So they can have different names. Now, Satchit Anandsu, Asti Panti Pre, which is written in the Sanskrit text, is basically the supreme truth, is the complete truth, so it does not change, it's constant in every way. Then the other one is the supreme consciousness, God is the only conscious being. It's the only, everything is running through the conscious nature of God. So that's where you talk about uh, Jethan, Jethan. That's where it is. It's consciousness. So everything else is insentient and only runs according to the conscious form of God. So where in Gurbani it states that a person can walk around, but the moment they die, it takes four other people to carry them because the Jethan, so the conscious form, has left that body. If something isn't conscious, it's, it doesn't move on its own. So, yeah, so that's what that is. So um, I'm just trying to think, where were we? We're talking about Vedanta. So schools thought panantheism is that. So we're talking about everything is, you know, the Sikhi form is panantheism, basically. Everything is part of God, but he is higher and he is sentient. And everything else just becomes an, an extension of his nature. Uh, Vedanta it rejects two schools of what we'd call modern uh, monism. One is uh, cos cosmotheism which is that God was created by man. And then the other one is pandeism, where it says that God was sentient at the start. So you get this in some schools of thought within the Jains and Buddhists, where it says God was sentient at the start, he was conscious at the start, but the moment he created the universe, he became part of the universe, and then has since then been become insentient. 
so yes, yeah, so that's that's their school of thought. So they they believe that um, obviously we believe that the only thing that exists, the only thing that's true, is God. But in Jainism, they believe that the universe is is true as well. It, it exists as it is and will always exist and existed before. Um, so people like Descartes, Spinoza, Rousseau they only take you so far. But the use of Sikhi or Vedanta is to realize your true nature and become one. Their their thought is that you are only true while you're alive. Well, Gurbani and uh, the Eastern schools of thought will say that actually what is true isn't is, isn't your body, isn't your mind, isn't this. And like, like I said, you get the the, um, the true form is to become one where there is no separation with God. So like I said, you get the lines in Gurbani which have considered Vedantic, and I'll explain why they're Vedantic, but like, like I said earlier, Har Har Jandurika, that line comes in. From Sri Guru Gobind Singh Ji. So you get in Gurbani, you get Tisra Pasha saying Mantu Jot Sarup hai Apana Mool Pashan. And then you get uh, Pad Kabir Ji saying Tu Tu uh, Kabir Tu Tu Karta Tu Hua Mujh Me Raha Na Hoon Jab Aap 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 Ka Mit Gaya uh, Jad Dekha Tattu. Like how you were saying, where you were saying about Descartes saying, talking about the I, Kabir is saying there, when Jab Aap 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 uh, Ka Mit Gaya. So he has when the I-ness of myself went, there's only you left. That's all there's, there is. I'm glad you mentioned that because it actually connects to, to what I want to ask, which is, so in the podcast I did with Gamal, we spoke very quickly about Akal Ustad. Now, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but from my limited understanding, it seems that, and again, I think this is perhaps the beauty of Sikhi because it's 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 quite complex. But from what I understood from Akal Ustad, which is Guru Gobind Singh is being anti-theistic in the sense of the even the notion of a god like a God figure in the Judeo-Christian sense is rejected. Like my personal interpretation of it was, it seems as though it's almost arguing that by almost trying to define and label itness or the God figure or whatever you want to call it, you're creating a separation. So by almost arguing that it is everything, including I, you, and the medium in between, then there is no there is no I, there is no God. But I guess that's just intellectual like arguing. I think I think you know you look at the Karastath and there's like the, the problem you have is you you cannot do a straightforward translation of it because you look at it and think to yourself actually this is hypocritical to this body here this body is hypocritical to this body so you need to understand where the Atanika is where each line is being said what is being uttered so when you get like the lines where you know the 16 times it says tuhi 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 tu, you're looking at a, a Vedantic sort of form of everything is God and then you got lines earlier on where it says that actually if you think that you can be liberated by washing or you know being um, constantly taking ritual bathe, bathing and things like that then why aren't the frogs or one with God. Why, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? So they, they go into all sorts within that body where they're, they're breaking down all the condoms, all the, the false play, all the false things that people are doing. But at the same time, you know, they're sat at the bar side where they're seeing, saying, jealous to him, tell us to him. You know, they're saying that God is within everything. When they're seeing the death take place in front of them of the, the hunter, the fish, the deer, the eagle at the same time. Um, so I think the problem you have with Das and Barney's, and I've I haven't seen a Dika that I'm quite happy with yet, where the explanations aren't ongoing. They'll just translate the words, but you need what is taking place at the time, commentary on it as well. Uh, and I think the problem you have with reading um, Das and Bani that way, the Akalas, is that you will have people misinterpreting it. And you're right, they are trying to get rid of the Judeo-Christian. There is only one God and he is unreachable and fathomable and we can't do anything about it. Well, like you said, good woman seems to be within that. He's putting in the feminine aspects as well. Putting in aspects of, like you said, they'll, they'll say, why are you bathing this many times? If you, if you think you can sit there by being quiet, you can gain God. Well, why haven't the rocks and the mountains gained it? Why haven't these gained it? Why haven't that gained it? And they're putting questions in your head. It's, it's, it's one of those Barneys, I can remember, I went through the Katha with uh, Sanskrit Jain Singh Ji, and, you know, every time you'd go back, they'd be back on the same body again, and it's another interpretation, another interpretation. It's um, it, it's difficult, it's difficult for, because I will have a view here, and then somebody else will have a view somewhere else. And I think that's the good thing about Gurbani, that Gurbani is like, uh, like Gurnandi says, it's a, a, a God boy. It's beyond comprehension. And I think, yeah, 
what they're going through in that good warming scene is same as how we go through the Japji side where it takes place at, due to different things that they're seeing, different things that are happening in front of them. And you look at some of those things where they're saying, like you say, do not bathe. Why are you bathing like this? Why are you actually bathing? Because at the time they're having a conversation or they they are talking about holy men that are coming from different groups in front of them. And they're considering them to be more holy than any other people because of the certain things that they do. And Guru Gorm Singh is saying, actually, what you're doing is just for show. What you're doing is we'll make you holy and become one with God. Why aren't the frogs like this? Why aren't the trees like this? Why aren't these people like this? Or these animals, one with God, based on what you say? But doesn't then that depend on the perspective? Because technically that doesn't necessarily like usurp the idea of it being like anti-theistic because it's almost like saying, the because the, I guess technically it's just pointing to the homer in that regard of actually you can do X, Y, and Z, but if you're doing that... If you're doing that for show, it's just show. That's it. Yeah. And that's what they're saying. When the ritualistic behavior is that, well, you know, the essence of, you know, what good worms is you're defining within their good body is that exactly the same as you'll find in Guru Granth Sahib where it's Tuhi, Tuhi, you know, God is everything. He's all-encompassing. He's It's not like the, the Christian faith of he's sat within the seventh heaven, he's just sat there and he's almost unobtainable up until that point or you'll only receive him upon death or, you know, sort of thing. You can, and like, so, you know, within Gyan Prabhu, things like that, they mentioned becoming a Mukta, a Jeevan Mukta, you know, uh, that you can reach them within this life. Again, this I, I love having these conversations because they lead into so many different avenues. So just then to kind of summarize, Vedant in a sentence or, or two is essentially Indic schools of philosophy that uh, reject two. You said they rejected two. One was monism and one was... <clears throat> no, well, they, they, they accept, it's a, it is a monism. That's what it is. But within monism, you get loads and loads of other schools. So they reject um, cosmotheism and they reject pandeism, which are two schools of monism. And you'll find Vedanta, and I explained Vedanta later on, there's different schools of Vedanta as well. And it's in exactly the same way. There's, so those are schools of thought that they reject, but there's others that can be encompassing. So you get, um, like I said, pantheism and panantheism. They sort of fit in to the Indic, Indic rules of Vedanta. And... Like again, I'm I'm sure we'll we'll talk about it in detail further on. But like, would it be fair to say then that Vedan obviously it has different schools of thought? But I'm assuming some of these concepts are almost like complementary or are running parallel. Yeah, you get you know it's it's <laughs> this again sounds silly, but it's like um it's like having a conversation within all the Jatya Bandis and Sampradas. You'll have ninety percent of the things that are exactly the same in all the Sampradas, and then somebody will have something different here and something different there. And that's that's basically how it is with that. So the schools of Vedanta are exactly the same, where the majority of the things are similar in every manner. And then they'll have their minor differences dep- dependent on a sargun form or, you know, the three guns here or something here. You know, it goes that way, but it's the same there. Okay. And would it be then also fair to say that a lot of Gurbani is based or, like, is developed out of Vedant? Well, the, the interesting thing is when you hear the Katha of Suvi Ransaraj, when it starts the Katha, the, the mentioning of um, the, the questions and answers that are put forward to Guru Rogan Singh Ji through Dham Dham when they're going through everything. And the question is that, do you believe in the Vids? Do you believe that the Vids are religious texts? And it's basically yes. But Gurbani is Satantar. It is independent from it. It's independent in every way. What Gurbani does is it it allows uh, for schools of thought to be used. You know, so there are there's Bhagavad Bani that mentions uh, the use of chakras, the use of yogic astral centers within your body, um, which is according to the Yog Shastra. And again, Vedanta is one of the schools of thought that when you look at some of these. Uh, when you look at a lot of the Shabbats, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the Atma, the Jeev, Jeev Atma, um, which are all Vedantic terms. Um, and then it, it basically, the Vedant Shastra and Gurbani is similar in the way that the essential goal is for the oneness. The oneness, that's what you're looking for. The, the, there's no difference between the Atma and Paramatma. This is perfect because it lends us into the next question, which is then when we talk about terms like Atma, Paratma, Jeev, what are, like what 
are we referring to in respect like are we I, i'm assuming we're talking about consciousness and how that then obviously like your atma is i guess like your consciousness and but atma is like the sub the supreme consciousness so to speak but just wanted to get your kind of what you would define those terms as right these are see the thing is if, if i was to mention the word consciousness somebody who actually the consciousness is part of the antishkaran the antishkaran is made up of the mind the body the hung so that's mind intellect consciousness and uh the ego so that can't be god so basically there's a praman there's a line that's said within gurbani whenever you do katha and it's yene 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 hoy this the pare sat hai so it's it's not this it's not this it's not this beyond this is what is true and that is what what is considered to be god So with these terms you get like jeev jeev is considered like the individual the individual self the atma is considered to be the universal self which allows for sentience a body without the atma would leave it to be in sentient the body doesn't move it doesn't do anything it's got no ability so the jeev atma itself is the body with the atma in it which is the individual self for audiences i know somebody's going to email me after this going this doesn't make sense um but the jeev atma is different to paramatma and the atma and that is due to ignorance causing or maya causing two things one is vikship vikship and the other one is avaran those are two abilities that maya has vikship and avaran are basically concealment of the truth and uh, the other one is the the ability to see where we see lots of things we're witnessing lots of things but not realizing that all the things that we're seeing is actually the form of one god so ignorance causes the jeev atma or the jeev with the atma to experience all these things so that's why we're all here we're all talking to each other we're all doing things but at the same time we can't experience the the oneness atma paramatma so atma is like I said the universal self which allows sentience paramatma is god or considered to be god or brahm they have no difference between them and uh, the, the the easiest way to explain it is i always go with the analogy of having a earthen pot um on top of the ocean and the earthen pot has got water in it and then obviously it's on top of the water of the ocean and there's no difference between the water in the pot no difference between the water outside of the pot but the pot is the um the jeev it's the ignorance that's holding it together break the pot and they merge and there's no difference so yeah that's the analogy we do and then if uh you know bond of galab singh who's uh one of the earliest nirmalas he's got a text called the moksha pant prakash and uh within the fifth nirmalas I've, i've got this written on my wall here so i can read it straight to you to be honest um but uh pandit galab singh has got a, a thing in, in the fifth first nirmalas which is first chapter in that he says that um uh one speaks of the body being the atma another states that it's the indriya which is um your senses some state that it's the prans which is your life breaths some believe it is the mind the intellects the intellectuals hold the consciousness to be the atma another believes that ishwar is an element but states that both the, the atma is sentient and insentient the nyayakas who are the people who um, basically uh, what would consider to be atheists um consider it to be insentient due to pride and ignorance many different interpretations have been provided such as the atma being either atomic medium or gross have all been interpreted these are the many interpretations that have been explained and those foolish people do not deliberate upon the scriptures when the atma is combined with ignorance then it performs all actions like we're doing now where is jeev atma the results this results in the self becoming detached without righteousness the atma is the form of supreme truth supreme consciousness and complete bliss and is considered Uh, one by the vedantis so that's what he says there and that goes in line with gurunan dev ji's shabd in rag maru where they say atam ram hai ram hai atam and again he gurunan dev ji says that again in um pad aur rag where they say atam mahi ram ram mahi at and sri guru gobind singh ji again says it in dasam many a times sri guru sri dasam granth where they say uh, ye brahm hai atam ram within gyan prabod so that's what the saying it's the oneness nice Nice. I'm just processing everything you said because it's making 
it's making me think um and 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 yeah i'm doing like mental gymnastics but no that makes that makes a lot of sense and i also like that quote that you've provided because i think that really gives a like an like a really nice kind of encapsulation of what we're talking about here um without also then falling into traps of like defining it kind of in in a term it's, it's basically when 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 Guru Singh says near to near to bin to you know when job I was right it's not this it's not this you know the the Romans say niti niti and same with the Greeks it's not this it's not this and that's what we're talking in front of the glass is saying it's like unless you you realize it how, how are you supposed to know we can say all these things um and uh, and we just has as a shop would say, you know, gun get there, gur You know, you give the person who can't speak gur and ask them to explain the the, the rasa that they've had from it. They can't do it, and that's what happens when somebody becomes one with the atma themselves. That they can't tell the essence. It's it's so great that they can't even explain it. Would it be fair to say the emphasis of Vedant is on the experience of? it so to speak whereas the objective of western philosophy is just to kind of intellectualize and rationalize and just yes that's yeah. basically that's that's what the western philosophy is to try to understand what makes us tick what i am what why i'm here they have no religious experience of it it's just a case of i'm, I'm here but what's keeping me going why am i walking why am i talking what is causing this uh while the vedantic philosophy is exactly the same as the goodman philosophy where it says in uh, your opportunity now is to become one with God. You know, this is your opportunity. It's took many, many births for you to get here. Use that wisely. So Vedant and Gurbani say exactly the same thing, that we are an unsub- we are a portion of Paramatma, while well, our, our, our true self is a portion of Atma. This world is a fallacy and it's Maya. Break, detach from this, become one with God. You can do it within this life. Because Bhagat Bhani says within Gurwani that nobody becomes liberated after death. You can only do it in life. So Jeevan Mukti is the, is the goal? You look for Jeevan Mukti. If you ain't got Jeevan Mukti, then you're looking at uh, the, you know, trying to get as much calm, good karma together to go to have the opportunity again, basically. Just a, a question that I always like to ask people like yourself who have a better understanding of things than, than I certainly do, which is there's that Shabbat Bhagavad Devji, which is Rajana Chao, Mukta Chao. From the, the little I re, re, like understood of it, is Maharaj is saying like even I don't want I don't want kingdom, I don't want mukti, I don't want anything. So how like how does that fit into the wider kind of scheme, if that makes sense? What they're saying is that they're saying that you can ask for these things, but what you are asking for is uh, temporal. It's it's not permanent. There's no permanence in it. So what you should be asking for is what is what is permanent. The only thing permanent is Padmatha. And the only thing you can do is to look for the opportunity to try to merge with what is true. Because it doesn't matter what position you gain within the celestial world or the galaxy, whether you become a devta or whatever, it doesn't matter. You you can ask for all these things, but they're only temporal. So that that's basically what Gurbani is saying all the time, that actually this is the opportunity to become one with, you know, to go back to where I initially came from. That's what that is. Okay. No, I really, I'm really enjoying this. Uh, so one thing that you mentioned is that there are four main Mahavak. Now, I just wanted you to expand on, for, first of all, what does that term mean? And then what are these four different um, Mahavak? No, that's fine. When you um, start learning your katha, the, the t- two things I'll teach you is this, Avantalvak and Mahavak. Basically, we don't, the other one we don't need to consider. It's just, you, you know, it's terms and things that are stated. But Mahavak are considered to be, Maha means great and Vak is statement. So gr- these are great statements. So basically what you have is what is considered to be the great statements that are the essential truths. So within um, Eastern Eastern philosophy, there's four, four Mahavaks. So each Ved is said to have only been an utterance from uh, the deity Brahma. But all he said was one Mahavak. And then the rest of the Veds are created around that one Vark. Uh, so the one word, so we get, let's see, we've got four, four Veds. So you've got the... The let's say the oldest Ved is the Rig Ved. So within the Rig Ved, you've got the first Mahavak, which is Pragyaman and the Brahm. So what that means is um, the Atma and, 
Atma with the Pran or Brahm. That's what it's basically saying. And you can also find that within um, the Tundogya Upanishad. Uh, the second Mahavak that you have is the uh, Ahana Brahm Asmi. That's within the Yujarvarid. And you'll they have all of the, the Chad Mahavak. The, the two that you'll hear is one is Ahana Brahm Asmi. That's the most common one you'll hear from uh, Sanatanis today. And there's one later on. So you get the Ahan Brahm Asmi, which means I am a portion of Brahm. So basically, like I said, it's a drop of water with the ocean. That's what, that's what they're considering. So that's found within the Yudhaviyad and the um, Brihadriyanak um, openish that's in there as well. The third one, let's see, what's the third Vid? The third third one, third Vid is the Sham Vid. And within Sham Vid, you'll find the uh, Mahavak Tattvan Asmi. That's the second one that you'll hear from the Sanatanis or the Sadhus within India that... That's the one that they'll use, that the one asmi, which means thou art that. Basically, you are that, or I am that. Um, and that's found within the Shamvir and in the A3 Upanishad. So the Guru has also done that, that great statement and provided that great statement within Gurbani. It's actually provided within uh, Sri Japji. So I'll just go through, quickly go through the four again. So Pragyamana the Brahm is the first Mahavak, and that's found. Uh, within the Rigved and the Chandogya Upanishad, and it says Pragyaman and Brahm basically means Atman with the Brahm is Brahm. That's what it's saying. The second one is the Yujaved, and within the Brihadra Yanak uh, Upanishad, it says I am uh, Ahan Brahmasri. That's what it says, Ahan Brahmasri, which means I am a portion of Brahm. And like I said, that you'll hear Sadhus on like some of the Indian TV channels, they'll be saying that again and again. Um, the third one is Tatvanasmi, which is from the Shamved and the Aitri Upanishad, which means that thou art that or you are that. And then the last last uh, Mahavag is I am Atam Brahm, which means the Brahm, the Atma is Brahm. And that's found in the Tarvan Ved and the And um, like I said, what the, the essence of the Mahavag is their great statements that are there to uh, assist in the unity of the individual with the reality of everything. That's what they're basically saying, that imploring you to do. So, like I said, um, Pandit Glavstein, who I mentioned earlier on, is linked uh, to four great Nirmala grants. We had a quote earlier on, I did a quote earlier on from the Moksha He also wrote another grant called the, the Artham Ramayan, which is an internal battle within the body, basically about the Ramayana, and it goes into it. So everything has an intrinsic definition or a meaning. But within that, uh, there's a quote, and so I'll just quickly quote it. It says, uh, udare, tahe sarda udare, ved, jeev lake aped. So what that's saying is, it's saying the great statement, Tatvan Asmi, brings liberation. It causes a person to seek salvation and to adopt faith. Through the grace of the Guru, listen to these utterances. Realize that there is no difference between the Jeev and the Paramatma. So these are the great statements, these are the great Mahavaks that are, that are held within Eastern philosophy, saying that this is your reality, this is what you want to try to achieve. So the Guru uses everything that is righteousness. You know, Gurbani is all about the truth, it's not about whether this is to do with this faith or that faith, they'll only use what is what is the reality of life. And you get, um, within the Jabji Sai, we will every day utter the Jabji Sai without realising its definitions, its meanings, its background. And um, we get the four Mahavaks, believe it or not, within the Jabji Sai. It's the same Mahavak that's said four times, and it goes from the 16th to the 19th body. And everybody reads it every day, it says, Tu Sada Salam at the you know, and what it says is, you know, still sell Islam is trying, uh, you know, if you look at the Katha, it said you should always place your thoughts and faith on the one constant formless God, as this is your form. Realize that you are the form of God. That's what Tulsa Islam Nunka. And then you get uh, Kavi Sadok Singhji, who um, wrote the Sri Gorpatap Surj Prakash. They also wrote a commentary called the Garab Ganjani Tika of the Japji Sahib. It was actually written, it's called Garab Ganjani, it means the, the, the destroyer of um, uh, pride, because there was an Odasi who wrote a deek on the Jabji side and they wanted to destroy his pride because of what he'd written in there. But he writes with his commentary of the Jabji side on that 16th body, he writes, after that, Tu Sala Salam Tanakar, he writes, Isatokume Mahavakya, Ese Tu Pada, Se Tu Pada, Sala Salamat Pad, Se Tat Pada. 
निरंकार पद से असपद तत्पद का अर्थ वन पद का अनवय होता है Now I know people are going to listen to that and go, I don't know what that means. So I've got, I've got a quick. Um, I'm actually writing another book at the moment, so I've just got that written down. And uh, what Govind and Thoksin Ji they're saying is this verse contains the great statement, the Mahava, in the way that the Tu in that that one asked me. So the Tu there represents the Tuan, the Jeev. So the Tu that's written in Tu Sada Salam to Nankar is the same thing. And he says the constant formless so Sada Salam. Indicates the tatapad. The tatapad means basically the the um, so at one is the jeev. Tatapad is Ishwar or Brahm or God, and it says Nirankar is the real identity. Due to this, the tat and the one have this relationship. And and Guru Bani Sadgani Guru Bhushan Singh Ji writes that this Mahavak Tu Salaslam with Nirankar is mentioned four times to mimic the four Mahavaks that they have within the Sanatan Tarim. And it's further explained by Kavi Santosh Singh Ji again within um, the C Nanak Prakash. It's written there. Uh, the Prasangs of Shemi Pasha, where they're doing question and answers with their six, and they're going through the Jabji Sahib definitions with by Bidhi Chand. Uh, Sri Guru Gobind Singh Ji explained the Jabji Sahib Mahima and explained it within there. And the fifth root of the Sri Guru Pratap Suraj Prakash has by Bidhi Chand Ji explained to the six. All the Vedanta philosophy, and it's stated there. So this great Mahavak is granted by the Guru, and is equivalent to the one found within the Sham Ved. Um, but the last mean that's what we have within Gurbani every day. So the Mahavak, and that's what Gurbani has. Gurbani is different to the other scriptures, where instead of actually having four Mahavaks, the whole Gurbani is a Mahavak because it's explaining the essential, realistic nature of life and death and everything all the time. And it's telling you again and again that this is the reality. Earn for it, yearn for it, do what you can for it. Okay, no, that that makes. I really like that um, explanation. Now, one thing that I think a lot of Sikhs or anyone who identifies as Sikh gets quite um, irritated with is that often on social media there's some pseudo scholar or there's some normally right wing Hindu nationalist who's trying to expose, in their view, um, some type of conspiracy that Sikhs are basically Hindu and they point to all of these different false truths. And when I say false truths, they so for argument's sake, there was a recent um, Twitter handle that was trying to argue Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji Shahidi was uh, sorry Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji was a Hindu and uh, Javala basically took the guy to task and was like you're actually using a translation from this point and you're not using the earlier one and hence why there are these differences and whatever now I'd love to get your opinion on this question which is everything we've been talking about in terms of Vedanta a lot of people would argue it's oh that's Hindu like that's Hindu philosophy what does that have to do with Gurbani Gurbani is all like Sikhi and, and whatever now I personally would say that those modern that differences between hinduism and sikhism don't necessarily exist within the shared philosophy within india obviously gurbani is a revolution in that it's unique but obviously throughout our conversation we've been talking about what a lot of people would assume or would label as being hindu now i just want to get your understanding or how would you explain this to those listening in terms of what makes it different from everything else like what makes the Sikh use of Vedant different to the yogi who's sat at Hardwar for argument's sake? No, it's, a, it's an interesting question. It is. It's, it's the first thing you're going to get when you, you put this up where they go, hang on, what you're talking about is, is Hinduism. Um, but in the same way that if you were to turn around and go, actually, you, you know, there's there's people who are using Vyakaran. So they look at Gurbani and they'll use uh, Vyakaran every day. And they'll go, actually, grammatically, this, this Shabbat means this. And this Shabbat means this. But they won't realize, actually, the, the person who created the Akron was Rishi Bani. And he was a Shivite. So it doesn't mean by using a tool that we are converting Gurbani to a Hinduistic philosophy. We're not doing that in, in Vedanta. Vedanta in itself is a school of thought. Like I said before, it's an independent school of thought. It's independent to Gurbani. It, it can help an individual understand what the essential nature is of Gurbani or what the message of Gurbani is. Um, because we have a lot of... I, I saw the post that Jawala was on about. And obviously, I, I, you know, I, I totally agree with everything he's put from Gurusobha, you know, and the Gurbalas and things like that. So, yeah, totally, he, he put him to task. And that's what we're having. We are having a lot of prominent right-wing individuals saying, actually, you are just, you're making all these things up. This didn't happen. 
um, you know, we, we call they are they're the ungrateful individuals who don't realize the shit the Maharaj gave. So, we're going to listen to this with, and go, well, Vedanta has nothing to do with it. Vedanta isn't actually Hinduism. That's what you don't understand. <laughs> what the six Shastras are, so where it says, Shekar, 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 there's good, 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 that's what it's saying. It's saying there are six schools, six philosophers, and six houses. And they all say that God is one. And, you know, Guru Guru Guru, there's, there's loads of people teaching it. So the analogy you get with Vedant is um, I've uh, created uh, one of my translations I've done is on a book called Vichadamala. And on the front of the Vichadamala is a picture of uh, an elephant with six individuals, blind individuals touching the um, elephant. That's that's what that's the six shastras. That's that's the analogy of the six shastras. So what the what the elephant is is defined as God. And you get six blind individuals touching the elephant. And six individuals are explaining the truth, but only from their perspective. So that's what the six shastras are. So the one that's touching the tail is going, no, actually, this elephant is like a rope. The other one touching the tusk is going, no, this is really hard, and it's really, really um, smooth to search. The other one is touching the trunk is saying, no, it's withered, and it's really large. And that's what the six shastras are. They're talking about the same thing, but from a different perspective. Now, in my job, if we have an... I work in the police, and if we have an incident, and you have six different people giving you a perspective from six different locations, none of them will ever match up. And that's what Vedanta is. Vedanta is a partial image of what is taking place. You know, it, it take, takes into consideration other bits as well, but but not much of it. They're basically, their essential thing is, I am God, there is God, there is no difference between me. Gurbani goes against that, going, actually... The problem you have with Vedanta is that you have a lot of people going, oh, 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 you know, you get Sadhu sat there going, you know, and what Gurbani does is the complete opposite, where it says, unlike Vedanta, you need a guru. You know, it's within the Jabji so God Prasad is one of the first elements that God says to Gurbani. You need a guru, you need to eradicate your oneness, you need to eradicate your ego. Uh, Guru Gobind Singh Ji in, in uh, Dasan, uh, in Bhajitra Nartik, when they're talking about Abhma uh, Apni Katha Bakhanam, they say Kitabach. They consider themselves to be an ant, an insect. And this is the insect talking to God. You know, within um, uh, Vichar Sagar, which is a big Vedan text that is taught all the time, it starts off with saying, I am the essence, I am this, I am that. It's completely opposite um, when you are uh, comparing it to Gurbani. So people will have that where they go, well, this is Hinduism, this is this. One, it's not Hinduism, it's a school of philosophy and a school of thought. And two, there are differences, and that's why we do not focus on Vedant as being complete, um, because the eradication of pride and ego are, are you know, not there within um, Vedanta, although it talks about it, but you don't need a guru, you don't need to serve anywhere, you can just read a load of Vedanta Granth and go, I know the essence is this, I am this. But what Gurbani does is it teaches the the what is considered the easiest route to becoming one with God. Now, Vedanta comes from the Veds itself. Now, the Veds is made up of 100,000 surtiya, which are statements. Out of that, 80,000 of them focus on uh, karam, which is what actions to perform, what to do. 16,000 are based on Upashna, which is how to do the different types of worship. Um, but only 4,000 are the Gyan. That is the knowledge. And that is what is considered Vedanta. Vedanta then elaborates on these 4,000 lines, and from that creates like the Upanishads. The Upanishads are all Vedanta. And the Vedanta text comes in later on as well. Um, but basically, that's basically what the Gurus were doing. The Gurus were like, these are the essential philosophies. All this other rubbish that you lot do isn't for us. It isn't. It isn't for us. And it's you know, Guru Gobind says, if I continue on, this grunt will become too big. Probably some thoughts. Singh says it as well. You know, again and again, most of the grunts say that if I carry on, this will be too big. I think with the Dasan, it's very different. Guru Gobind Singh just wants to put, especially when you start looking into the condition of Thad, they focus just on battles, the warriorship, the beard, that's what they're focused on. Um, but, you know, you look at, I'm just going to, sorry, go back into the Vedanta itself. Um, you know how I was saying that you've got Upanishads. Upanishads are just folk, supposed to be focused on 
a oneness, creating a oneness. So like I said, you got the, the Aitri Upanish, the Chandogya Upanish. There's supposed to be 108 Upanish. There isn't, there's loads. Um, by Khan Singh Nabai and the Mahan Kush says there's 170. In actual fact, there's way over 220. And there's new ones being made all the time. Uh, you know, there's um, the Ram Tapani Upanish, which people who follow Ram have made. Uh, Swami Shankar Chand from Sindh was a follower of Guru Nanak Dev Ji, so he made the Nanak Upanish. You know, you'll find now Upanish written in Braj, Farsi, Hindi. You got Dara Shakur, who was the elder brother of Aurangzeb. He was trying to, he had translated 50 Upanish into um, his common dialect, including the Allah Upanish. You know, so all focus on Vedant. And Vedant is, like you said, it's a school of thought. It's one of the six schools of thought. So you got Yog, Sankhya, Mamansa, Vivesha, Kanyai. So one of those is a completely atheistic tradition. One is obviously a yoga tradition. One is the Nyaya is like Rousseau, like Descartes. It focuses on logic itself. That is all that one focuses on. Uh, Vishesha, you know, they're, they're, all, they're all different, but they all have different views. Um, and then, like I said, when we talk about Vedanta, there's there's loads of schools of Vedanta. One is um, Dvaita, Dvaita Advant, Vedanta, which is... Um, uh, sorry, Dvaita Dvaita Vedanta, which is basically saying that humans are different and non-different from Ishvar. Advait is saying that the Brahm and Atma are the same and everything else is Maya, so that is monism. And Gurbani is Advait, but it is independent from the Vedas. So where we get Pagat Kabirji, Ramanand, all them, they're all basically influenced by Advait Vedanta. So the Pagati school of thought is from there. The interesting school of Vedanta I, I like is the Vashishta Advait. Um, I, I consider it close to Sikhi. It's not at the same time as well. But you get to Ramanuj, who's uh, a sadhu, uh, before obviously Sikhi comes in. He says that, that God, Brahm alone exists, but uh, but everything that you see in Sargon is real as well. So where you get the line, Sabagobinda, Sabagobinda, Gobinda, Binda, Hikoi, or let's see, uh, Guru Ramadas is saying, E Jag Sachiki Kotri. You know, that what, what I can see, what I perceive in front of me, everything is real. But the difference they have is they believe that, in fact, it wasn't a Nirankar god that then became a Sargon form. They believe the other way, that there's a, a Sargon form and then he came into a Nirgun form. So that's that's different. Yeah, you're looking at monism. And Vedanta isn't only exclusive to India. In the way that like we said, there is monism. For, but if you look into Islam... You got the Wadat al Wujud, which is the unity of existence, which was created by Ibn Arabi, a sadhu who went from Spain all the way to India through Palestine, uh, but he created that, and it is very, very similar to Advaita Vedanta. Um, and that was a big school of thought in Shia Islam, Shia Islam, and Sufi Islam until uh, Ahmed Sarandi, a very close confidant of Jahangir. Hated Guru Arjun Dev Ji. His uh, masjid and place of worship is at Fatigar Sahib. Ahmed Sarhandi hated the Wadat al Wujud because he saw that it was too close to Hinduism. He hated it. He absolutely hated it. So he critiqued the Wadat al Wujud and created the Wadat Ash Shamud. And he says that obviously this unity of existence, this becoming one with God and being one with God. In, in this world doesn't exist. It's not Islam. It's, it's, as far as he's concerned, it's a perverse sort of ritualistic thing in Hinduism that has just been adopted by, by Islam. But I was listening to a, um, a conference from the University of Habib in Pakistan uh, only the other night, and they were on about it. They were going through that, the Wadat al Wujud, and just about how close it is to monism and what we would consider Gurbani, basically. Does that school still exist? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, there's, uh, basically, that, there's two schools of thought within them, so the Wadat al Wujud is still, you know, there's lots of people that go into it and talk about it, uh, within, especially the Sufis, so we know within the Sufi tradition you get uh, Mansur from, you know, within the 8th century who says the terms Anil Haq, and then you get Saramad later on, and then you still get them today where they believe that there is a oneness, there is a unity between the individual and, and Brahm. But it's 
think through the uh, the ignorance to get there. So, so is Bulle Shah's Kafis, etc. Is that again from that school? Bulle Shah, Shams Tabriz, you know, Gurnan Devji goes and sits on Shams Tabriz is uh, well when they get to uh, Multan and they speak about Shams Tabriz within the Srinanak Pradesh. It's exact same. Bulle Shah is exactly the same because obviously his relationship with Baba Bees and Jinnaranga Badawali as well. But, and, you know, even. Um, when we talk about both. I'm going to, I have to interrupt because you've just mentioned something that's really piqued my interest. So you mentioned Bulle Shah had a relationship with a Sikh. Yeah, well, as in, uh, Baba Bish and Jinnanda, when you see the, obviously the, um, uh, Manaj and Jisinji he wanted to obviously take over Multan. They were unable to. So what happens is, they say to Baba Bhus and Jinnanga Wadwali, who went with them into a lot of the battles, and they say to them, look, we're trying to take over Multan, but we can't every time we go, we're defeated. And Baba, Baba Bhus and Jinnanga Wadwali say, simple as this, they say, you can't take the city because Bulla Shah sat there and he's divine. And they said, you can only take the city if he leaves. So Baba Bhus and Jinnanga Wadwali send him a letter to Bulla Shah to say that Manaj and Jis Singh Ji wants to take the city. And it can only happen if you leave. And at that point, it's Bulle Shah who leaves that city. And then Maharaj and Jis Singh Ji takes over Multan. That comes in the Katha. Sant Gyani Gurbachan Singh Ji gives in the Katha. Comes in Sant Hari Singh Ji's Katha. Comes in the Nirmale Katha. Yeah, so yeah, so you get that. So within still schools of thought, you know, my friends are into Deobandis. And then you get Ismailis that I know. And obviously their focus is, is completely different. They focus on... You know, I'll, I'll speak about it later, but they focus on the the Bartin rather than the za, the Zahir. So basically, they focus on the intrinsic rather than the esoteric. Uh, sorry, they focus on the esoteric rather than the literal. Um, and they they focus on the Wada Dal Wujud as well. So they're like, actually, there is no separation between us and God. We can realize God within this world. So it does exist today, but it's becoming uh, one of those schools of thought where because of the rise of Wahhabism, it's seen as a perversion and people, again, are trying to push it sideways. Obviously, the main school of thought with the Swirling Dervishes that you get is Rumi, which is interesting because Rumi has the Masnavi Bakka, uh, which is his written word, the Masnavi, and the Seva Panthis have got that in Punjabi form. They teach that. They do Katha of it. So, and you can pick that up at Patiala University because, obviously, it's written by, uh, uh, by uh, Garu Seva Panthi. And uh, you can get a copy of that from them. Um, but yeah, even Peter Singh Nirmala mentions it on his, what used to be the old Siva on the um, website. So they use that. So you, when you get Ibn Arabi, who goes from Spain all the way to Turkey initially, he obviously is with that school of thought. So rolling dervishes, you get quite a few schools of thought, not as many in Turkey now because of obviously the secular nature there. So even when you go and see Rumi's places and things like that, things are hidden. But, um, you know, some of the schools of thought in Syria, uh, some of the schools of thought not in Iran as much, but in Pakistan still exists where they do believe that. It's now becoming a bit undercover. But then you get the schools of thought like, you know, like people like Nim Talahi, who's, who's a beard uh, within uh, Iran, who had prophesied Gurnan Devji coming there prior to Gurnan Devji actually being there. Uh, coming in, coming onto this earth, you know, their school of thought focus on that as well. Uh, they're mostly based in America, man. That's insane. That's insane. I love this because I get to learn so much as well in, 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 in doing it all. So one thing that you mentioned in preparation for this podcast is that a lot of the original Qatars and Tikas on Gurbani used to focus on Vedanta or, or not focus on, but Vedanta was included in its explanation and, and providing obviously the context required. Um, And you said that basically this kind of started to be phased out with the Singh Sabha movement. Now, could you explain a little bit more about this and why it happened and what happened? I think the, the thing that happens is once the things of a movement starts, it's fine. You know, the, the, you know, you get some Tundra Singhji along with it, Baba Kim Singhji, Bedi who are in it, you get some Tatra Singhji, they're all part of this movement at the time. But once we get the things of our movement actually comes in, they remove the Dasam. What they're trying to do is show their own distinction. We are Sikhs, we are completely different to all these things. So they consider, they fear Sikhi being considered a sect of Hinduism. Because like you said, most of the people are going to listen to this go, Vedanta Hinduism, not realise. Vedanta actually a school of thought, just as grammar 
hematology, you know, anything anything else. They're, they're all schools of thought and it can be applied. So what happens is you get a lack of understanding as well. Uh, and Sikhs are looking for their own independence to go, we are our own. We don't need Vedant to explain these things. And then you had exactly the same as Sarhandi, where Sikhs of that time were basically going, we're separate to them. Because we're separate to them, we shouldn't need to use those those tactics. We shouldn't need to use those sorts of schools of philosophy. We shouldn't need to interpret it in this way that's too similar to the way that they interpret to, to interpret things. And that's what basically happened. The inter, you know, they they just didn't want to be seen similar in any way. Uh, and there was a fear of being considered we are the same as them. We don't want to be the same as them. We're we're unique in our way, so we'll have a unique way of understanding. So from there, you see, um, obviously, the glance with Vedanta. They're left within like the the Nirmala Sevapanthis, you know, schools of thought. So Tuxali is a Nirmala school of thought. Sandhgani Yurvaj sings his Tika, Katha Sanjana sings his Tika. Uh, their Katha is all, you know, they use Vedanta constantly because they'll go through a line of good wine and say, this here is the Jeev, this here is the Atma, this is what you're supposed to be doing, this is how, you know, Machali Jin, Machali Jin, Pani, you know, they go through that, say, the Machi is this, the water is this, this is this. Uh, and they use all the metaphors in order for you to understand. But what the Sings of our movement did was get rid of those metaphors, and all of a sudden you are literally translating the words and sometimes not having that defined definition that you need to give to your Sikhs. The Nahangs, the Adasis, the Nirmala, Sirabhantis, you know, they have always maintained it. They've always kept it. Because what they do is they're trying to bring the Qatar in exactly the same form that Guru Gobind Singh Ji uttered at Dhamdama Sahib. So they've changed it in any way. You know, you look at the Digas by Sadhu Gurdit Singh, uh, you know, um, Kavi Santok Singh Ji, um, people like that, or Pandit Tara Singh Narottam, all of the dance Because they're trying to keep the teachings exactly as they were taught by Guru Gobind Singh. So if Guru Gobind Singh Ji says, this is the, the definition, and that's passed down to the next person. They kept it. What happened was the, the Sinsawa movement came in, and they then became like a new school of thought, Neo-Sikhism. And they wanted to promote Neo-Sikhism, that's all. It didn't stop any of the others from still teaching in, this, in the old ways that they did. And they continued. It's just it became more and more marginalised. And I'd say even 1984 is a big pivotal point because we get the Operation Blue Star, things happen, everything takes place, and then there becomes this Hindu phobia. Anything that can be linked to sort of Hindu values, Hindu ways, or Hindu religious teachings, we don't want to know about. And it, you know, it's sort of from, I'd say, there's like a, an age of darkness when it comes to Vidya, and, you know, it's sort of stopped, I'd say, 80 to, you know, only about 12 years. I'd say for 12 years it sort of stopped. But those who were still doing Katha were still doing Katha. They still continued those teachings. And now, I'd say with today's generation, where we've now got access to grants and things like that, we're all looking at these things going, well, they used to teach us 200 years ago like this. Why is it that the early grants say this? Why is it that we've got Vedantic grants being written under the tutelage of Guru Gobind Singh Ji and their Kavi So, yeah, it comes, it comes basically down to a fallacy of, if we keep with this, they'll think we're the same as them. We want to be separate, we're different. It's ignorance as well, more than anything. No, I couldn't disagree with anything you said. It's just always good to get various perspectives on the question. So again, correct me if I've got the wrong interpretation on this, but I think from from the, the chat we had just before putting the podcast together, um, that you mentioned that there are Vedantic texts and Niti texts. What is like what when you you've you've actually defined niti of like as we've been talking, but um just just for everyone listening, when we're talking about niti, what do we mean? Basically, we have a number of uh, texts to do with politics, ethics, or morals. Very similar to if you we were to look at what one of the things I like looking at is uh, Eastern philosophies in Chinese Japanese culture, and one of them is Taoism and Confucianism, which uh, both of them look at. It's more, rather than a religion, it is a way of life according to politics, ethics, and morals. So what we're looking at is the texts within Eastern philosophy that focus on that. So there's four main texts that are focused on as Niti texts within the Eastern Hemisphere. One is the Janaka Niti uh, that everybody seems to have a copy of in, in some form. You get the Partri Shatak Niti. Now, Partri was a yogi who obviously meets Gurunam Devji. Um, he writes three grants in his time. 
the Virag, Virag, uh, Viragya Shatopam, he had a text, like I'd say the Kama Sutra, and then he had a Niti text, a Patri Shatik Niti. Uh, you get the Vidur or Yudhisthir Niti text, and you get the Shukra Niti. So those are the four prominent ones you find within Indian schools of thought. And then, you know, they're, they're there, and they still influence Indian way of thought, Indian way of politics, the morals of life. Uh, and like you said, Chanaka Niti is the one that sticks in most Sikhs' minds because Kavi Senapati was under the tutelage of Sri Guru Gomsini in the Kavi Darwar, and uh, he was tasked with translating that uh, to provide knowledge on how to live in this world. And that's the one one text that you, you read, which is there to give you teachings on how to live within a country, within a community, what sort of ruler you should live under, how you should focus your life. Um, well, it talks about, obviously, people's lust, anger, things like that. It does talk upon those and how to deal with those as well. Thank, no, thank you for explaining that, because I think, I was kind of sat there going, are they the same or are they slightly different? But that makes a lot more more sense of of what's going on. Now, um, you've obviously explained a little about a, a little bit about Chankyaniti, and then you've you provided me a list of Vedantic texts. Some of them look pretty unpronounceable, I have to admit. But for argument's sake, Vichar uh, Sagar, Moksh, Pant Prakash, etc. So could you do a bit of a run-through about what they are and their significance, please? Master uh, Santori Singh has just released a book called the Panchakaran Tavali, which contains five texts. One is the um, Chankaniti, the other one Sarka Tavali, Pavra Samrit, Vichar Mala and Adyatam Prakash. I'll run through those and run through some other. So Chankaniti will run through. Um, we have the Sarkatavli, which is taught uh, as part of your Vedanta Vidya before you start going into Gurbani. Sarkatavli was written by, I'm trying to think who it is now, it's just come from my head, Pandit Hardial Singh. Pandit Hardial, uh, Pandit Hardialji, sorry, wasn't he? He was born in Lahore and he was a descendant of Pandit Beni Prasad. Pandit Beni Prasad was one of the 22 people who was sat on the Manjia from um, Sri Guru Amar Das's time. So he's a descendant of his. Obviously, he remains a pundit and learns his, his vidya. He comes to uh, Kanchi, Banaras, and Amritsar in the end, where he learns all of his Vedant. Now, so what you'll find with a lot of these Vedant texts is, as Guru Gobind Singh wanted, he wanted to make the knowledge attainable to the modern person. Now, when all knowledge is sat and written within... Um, a Sanskrit form, and the modern person doesn't speak Sanskrit, let alone read it. They don't understand what's going on. So the big thing at the time within the Bhakti movement period and um, Siddhartha Guru Gobind Singh's time was to translate into th- everything into a common vernacular. So what um, Sad Kutavali means, Sad means great, Kutav- or Kutavali means statements. So these are great statements, great utterings. Um, this is taken from other previous texts, and it this one has 15 uh, chapters of, of already translated this one so I can, can tell you what's in it but there's a chapter on like righteousness the guru and shish knowledge characteristics of a good person deliberation the four different types of people saying good things those who make an effort being charitable a chapter on vices a chapter on fools and saints um seven bad actions senses good qualities on the transformation of fools to great beings. So it's 15 different chapters, and those are the headings, those are the titles that they go through. And again, it's a, it's a Vedantic text that goes into, it's both ethical and Vedantic, and it's written in Braj uh, by Pandit Adhyalji. Second one, Bhavra Samrit, written by, like uh, somebody have mentioned twice already, uh, Pandit Gulab Singh. Pandit Gulab Singh was basically one of the earliest uh, Nirmalas to go uh, to Kanchi and start obtaining this knowledge unfortunately he wasn't allowed to sit in and listen to uh sorry wasn't allowed to have any books and obtain the knowledge so what he used to do was sit outside the videlas listen to everything memorize it take it home and write uh, so he had a great intellect to do this so above ras amrit so above means brilliant ras is obviously uh, esoteric pleasure or pleasure itself and amrit so what this uh, book is about is about bhakti and devotion and the uh, ras and brim that you get from bhakti itself and the amrita that you attain afterwards again it starts off with sargun um mongols as well so you get invocations to to ram sri uh, guru guru and singh ji within the sun pandit man singh uh, sant man singh who was a uh, pandit gulab singh's um ustad and he pandit uh, man singh actually took amrita from sri guru Gobind singh ji 
So that's that's where we get the lineage there. Vicharmala is a Vedantic um, text again, eight chapters, and it's actually an Adasi text, and it's written by um, Pandit Anathadas, and he had a friend called uh, Narottam Puri. And what this is is a question and answer session being sent in a letter form from one another. Well, the Vicharamala is based on a Sanskrit text called the, the Bicharamala, uh, which has been translated into Gurbani again. Um, and here it's got, like I said, it's got eight different chapters. It's both spiritual and Vedantic. It's very similar. You know, all these texts, if you read them, you'll read them and, and then look at Gurbani and go, I can't see much difference here. And in this one, you've got eight chapters. The first one is the disciple asking his teacher on how to avoid the bondages and pain of the world. Second chapter is about the satsangat and the characteristics of the sadhus. Uh, chapter three is about the seven foundation stages of knowledge, which some Kartar you mentioned within their katha. Uh, chapter four um, deals with the techniques used to gain knowledge. Um, chapter five, eradicating attachment and material desires and family. Chapter six is metaphors dealing with becoming and attached with the world. Uh, chapter seven is the teacher advising the people how to live their life. And the last one is the chapter uh, where the teacher is testing the disciple and congratulating them. So it is, like I said, you can imagine at that time they were sending letters to one another. And that's what this is. So you'll have a question asked and then the answer is given. Um, and that's that's what that text is. So that's a vijara mana. The Atam Prakash. Uh, interesting one. Uh, text on it's a Nirmala text written by Pandit Sukadev Singh, who was one of the 52 Kavis under Sri Guru Gobind Singh. So he writes that text whilst under the service of Guru Gobind Singh, but it finishes afterwards. Um, and that's just full of knowledge about your senses, uh, the length of the deities' lives, the Guru Shish relationship, uh, meditation. There's all sorts there. Let's see what else. Virag Shatak. Virag Shatak is written by Pandit Hardayalji, who obviously wrote the Sarkatavali as well. And that is based upon Parthri, Parthri's uh, Viragya, Viragya Shatakam. And it's all based on dispassion, how to become dispassionate towards the world. Um, so, you know, you get the, the line that all the sadhus use, which is Bin Bairagana Chuta Samaya. So, without dispassion, you, you cannot eradicate or leave this Maya behind. Maya just fills you up and covers you in bondage all the time. So that whole text is on about Virag, how to become dispassionate towards the world, turn away from the world and become focused and engrossed on the true self and devotion and meditation. Um, Vichar Sagar is an enormous grant. If, well, it's really difficult to read. First time you look at it, you just think, what is it? But uh, Pandit Nishil Dash, who's a Dadu Panthi, he writes that and it is... It is the, the big text that most of the Vidyalas teach you last when it comes to Vidyal. Um, it's, it's, uh, its essence is massive. I've got the Katha by Santjigin the Singh, Santjigji Singhji, and I forgot who else. I've got somebody else's. Oh, uh, Santpeja Singhji Kodasarwa on Gurmat Vichar. They do the Katha of that. Um, and, and that's huge and really difficult to understand. Um, Nishchal Das had a student by the name of Pitambar. And he does the first Dika on that Granth, and it's huge. Uh, Patambar also does a Vedanta Granth called the Vichar Chandarodhya. Translated that as well. That's two parts. And that is 260 questions on basically the essential self. What is God? What is the Jeev? What is um, the senses? What are the Mahapuds? What is this? What is that? It's all Vedanta. It doesn't really talk about religious uh, religion other than becoming one with God. Um, so then you get, like I said, the Moksh Pantha mentioned that, which is the Opus Magnus thesis on everything to do with Vedanta, written by um, Pandit Gulab Singh. Focuses on Vedanta, the Atma, Jeev, life. It's basically like a load of notes and collection of writings put together. And the first deco of that you can find, there's only one deco, and that's in Sanskrit by Pandit Tara Singh Narutta. Um, let's see, this. I could go on, there's the Tarik Singhre, there's loads and loads of other Vedanta Gurus that I've got sat here with me but I think we'll be here forever no 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 don't don't not a problem um so with those texts how would you define them as a whole so would you argue that you you kind these are almost complementary to Gurbani in that in reading them it will add like a layer of understanding and kind of context no I, the way I see it is if I was to look at Gurbani 
Gurbani would be defined as being your master's after your PhD is the last thing that you want to look at. Uh, and what these are, what Vedanta is, is, is your year one, year two, year three at school where you're learning your ABCs. That's how I consider Vedanta. So what these are is these are building the foundations in order. It's, it's like, you know, when you're at school, you, you know, my kids are sat here doing bodbass, which is like brackets, this, 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 you know, doing their subtraction. So they go through this process of understanding their math. And it's the same way. In order to understand those massive equations that you're going to do at a fundamental level of astrophysics or whatnot, which I would consider Gurbani. Gurbani is that difficult. You need your basics. These are your ABCs. This is your basic understanding and learning. Gurbani should be, I th- personally, it's a very different view in many other places. Many people just start on Gurbani straight away and start learning what the definitions and interpretations of Gurbani are. And that's where I think they fall apart because they've not done their basic foundation and their, their secondary sort of learning in order to understand everything that comes in Gurbani. You know, I believe Dasam should be read before Siddhi Guru Granth Sahib Ji. I believe the Sarvara should be read before Guru Granth Sahib Ji. I believe all the Vedanta texts, Pai Guru Das Singh Vada, they should all be read before you start the learning the Katha of Siddhi Guru Granth Sahib Ji because everything that you are going to touch upon or mention is found in all those Granths first. Gurbani is the, a guard ball. It's, it's so difficult to understand that you need to do your training prior in order to understand it. You, you can't just go into a university and go, right, I want to learn astrophysics now. And they'll be like, well, where's your A-levels? Where's your GCSEs? Where's your case, key stage? And that's what you need. We'll save the question that I want to ask you for, for a little bit later on, but because um, I think that also nicely relates to then your translation work and how a lot of people who have attempted to translate texts in the past, because they don't have the, as you said, the foundationary kind of education, the, the translations don't necessarily do justice to what, what is actually being what is actually being said. I don't know. I don't believe mine are doing justice neither. Like I said, I just try to put into words what I've learned, but... I'm sure that somebody can do a better job of it. Believe me. I, I don't. I don't disagree. But I will. I also equally have to 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 say that your work is certainly opening up the door for a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't necessarily be exposed to to such a like a depth of understanding. So definitely some credence where where it's due. Just then moving the focus then slightly. So there was a list of what I would kind of classes pre-colonial Sikh texts. So Panchin, Padshahi Dasmiki, Kaur Singh, Kaur Palas, Padshahi Dasmi, Guru Ki Asakhiya, Bas Roop Singh, Koshish, Mema Prakash, Bansri Nama. Essentially, I just want you to help explain what these texts are to people listening, and what their significance is. I wanted to start with, um, so Seva Das is Panchin, Padshahi Dasmiki. The interesting thing about that text is it's written 1741. So it's before you get the Guru Palas that come out by God Singh and Sukhasing. Now, I'm sure if somebody reads this and they, they correct me, I'll be more than happy to put my hands up. But I've read that in Piala Singh Padam's uh, book, and he did most of the research on, on this text. Let's see, Sivadas was an Adasi who was Mata Bhagpuri's son. Mata Bhagpuri was a shish of Siri Guru Hargobindji. And obviously, Siri Guru Hargobindji had Baba Gurditta Ji, who became uh, the Tikka of the world, basically. Uh, because they were given the, they were both within the, the Guru's household and they were given the Gaddi of uh, Baba Sri Chanji after they left. Baba Sri Chanji had four Pune, what, what would they call it, four schools, and four disciples under him who set up the four main schools. One of them was Baba Alamast. So Sevadas studies under Baba Alamast. Um, it's written Parchi and Parchi Dasmi, um, because. The majority of the stories face, focus on Siddhi Guru Gobind Singh's uh, life. For the first seven gurus, there's only one story each. There's four on the eighth guru, and I think there's about five or six on the ninth guru, from what I remember. Unlike the other glance that you find at the time, which are written in a poetical form, this is actually written in a Vartic form, so it's something you can just read, you know, like, like a normal book, and it will make, make you, you know, you'll be able to understand what's taking place um, it's, you can find it in English. There is an English version out there because I've got it at my mum's house somewhere. But Piala Singh Padam, I remember he was the one that brought it back uh, as he was credited with republishing old work. It's considered, obviously, a writing from an Andasi perspective. And I think it comes because of one story. And that story is retold by Sadhguru Dar Singh Jupindarawai within um, their Katha. And it's about um, meat and spiritual avastha. 
it basically, there's a, there's a story where Sidi Gurgaon Singh invites all the Brahmins uh, to come and eat, says to all the Brahmins, those people who partake in the consumption of meat will be given 100 gold coins. Those people who eat the rice pudding will be given 100 silver coins. And obviously what they're showing was the uh, the hypocrisy of the Brahmins by eating the meat. So the majority of them ate the meat just because of the money. Once they had eaten uh, the meat, Sidi Gurgaon Singh just scolded them uh, and instead gave the 100 gold coins to the people who ate the rice pudding and um, gave the 100 silver coins to those who uh, ate the meat. And uh, obviously Sam Kutar Singh talks about it on uh, eating meat and how it... Uh, changes your spiritual avastha, which at the time you see all the other texts, they say a very different thing with regards to meat and seats at the time. But yeah, that's just a quick rundown of that one. What's the other? So does that, so it's because of that story that it's, it's surmised. That's, that's why it's surmised as being an Adasi text because those people, you know, those people who eat meat will go, I don't agree with that. Those people who don't eat meat will go, well, I do agree with that and I understand where that's come from. So, you know, you see the Nirmali and, uh, like I said, you see it come up in the Sampradaya Katha again and again, that story. You know, you get somebody like, um, uh, some Indiji Singh Lakhwiwali, they give, they even say in their Katha, you know, they they have done Katha about eating meat and uh, the Chatka and uh, Dig and things like that. But within their Katha as well, they also say that, you know, eating meat, uh, ruins your spiritual avastha, which is said within this gatha. And he comes from more of a Nahang background than a, than a Nirmala background. But that's what it is. So that's where you get the f- first defining moments where people go, this is a Khalsa text, this is a sort of non-Khalsa text. And that's it's because of that story. Okay, so then just moving on then to the next text. So this one is slightly interesting because I was reading... Um, I was reading J.S. Gurdwara's new book on Guru Gobind Singh Ji the other day, and he mentions Guru Gaur Singh's Guru Bharas Pacha and Dasmi. And then he explains that there's been uh, basically arguments about when people think it was written. So the work has been argued for some to be inspired by Pai Mani Singh Ji in that Punjab University, when they published Gaur Singh's Guru Bharas Pacha Dasmi in 1968, in their introduction, they quoted Baba Sumir Singh of Patna, who essentially argues that Pai Mani Singh Ji prepared a grant called Guru Bharas at the end of that grant and throughout that grant, Pai Mani Singh Ji's names appears. And then according to Forja Singh, Gurtej Singh, Gaur Singh wrote this text in 1751. However, on the flip side, Haja Oberai, Louis Fanet, Sujit Hans argue that the text is more likely to have come from the late 18th or the early 19th century. And part of the giveaway is apparently because there is awareness of the British and a reflection of Sikh sovereignty within the text. The issue you have there, there was a reflection of the British already. If Guru Gaur Singh Ji had a surgeon who was British, who had come to tend to his wounds, they were already aware of the British. Good Gaur Singh already knew the British were there because you get this... I'm going off anyway, but... Uh, there's a story of Guru Dei Wadaji looking when they're in Delhi and they're, sat, they're looking up on a roof and they're looking out towards what we would consider to be the sea. Uh, Baba Guru uh, Dei who were with them, asked them, say, what are you looking for? And they said, we're looking to see how far how far they are. And they're like, who? They said, those who are going to take the uh, take the uh, Rajasthani off the uh, Mughals, basically meaning the British. Guru Gorman Singh Ji of Patna, um, when they are there, they are playing with the kids as they used to, uh, with their little dramas and little uh, play, play warlike. Um, they used to play warlike games. And they were doing that when a Patan was on a um, an elephant dr- uh, walk, going by and Guru Gorman Singh Ji got in the way. The Pratan says to Guru Gobind Singh, he says, get out of the way. And Guru Gobind Singh, he pulls a face. And uh, the Pratan says to Guru Gobind Singh, I'll come and sort you out. And basically, Guru Gobind Singh says, they're going to come and beat you up. Basically referring to the British, because obviously by the time they got to India, they um, their faces were all uh, hot and uh, because of the humid and the heat, they're all pink, like how you see baboons' faces. Already knew that the British were coming. The Maharaj said it within the public of the Bani again and again. It comes within the Sasaki. So I'd argue that. And I know I know why they're saying it, but I, I agree with that the time was 1751. To be quite honest, you know, Maharaj had written within 
those sorts of things when they've talked about the people in the jund about the British and things like that. So they knew they were coming. Like I said, the British were already there, but they were on the other side. you got to remember, the British were there at the time of Sri Guru Har Gobind Ji. Uh, they were already on the east side of India. And you got to remember, at the same time, Guru Gobind Singh was brought up in Bihar after Sri Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji had been to Assam and come back from all that area where the British already were in. So they already had knowledge of the British at that time. I just want to go back on what on on the the, the sake you told me about Gurudev Bhadaji. So I I read a paper. I'll pull it out actually, and I'll send it to you after the podcast. But I read a paper about it's it's can't remember the guy who wrote it, but basically he argues that a lot of the stories that uh like so for argument's sake, the version of the story that you told me, I've read a slightly different one, which is basically yeah. saying that uh the British once they got to in, into Punjab or near Punjab, essentially took a lot of these texts or these kind of stories and re- wrote them to argue that the gurus almost pro- prophesized their coming in terms of almost like uh like ordained it or wished it or put like almost like it was like there they allowed that to happen what can you tell me about like what the the stories actually are saying and then how they were kind of manipulated because for argument's sake i didn't know that there was a true version of that story if that makes sense the, the problem you have seen is you got to look at it through a... <laughs> this is where we go into the Western philosophy sort of reason. You've got a reason and have a deductive sort of thought on it. The problem I have is I look at all texts and I'll, I'll do what like Fennec and people like that have done and, and look at it reasonably from my point of view. The problem is I'm, I'm just seeing who sits here, works as a police officer every day. I'm, I'm no individual to put a perspective on something. I think it comes down to Sharda mostly. And then whatever was supposed to happen was supposed to happen. The British were supposed to come in and that was supposed to happen, I think. Whether, if they were to manipulate the grants, it didn't mean that it was supposed to take place. Fair then. Just then, I guess, going back to the text, Gorsin's Gurbalas Parchai Dasmi then. So we, we've spoken about how it's a lot of it has come from Bhai Mani Singh Ji already passing this information down. Um, what else What else could you explain or, or tell us? There's those that say, obviously it was, it's, whether it was Gaur Singh itself, it was Baba Gurbakh Singh who was obviously from Baba Buddha Ji's lineage, who Guru Gobind Singh Ji had given him the var that he would see him every day because he wouldn't eat until he saw him every day. So Gavri Sadhbok Singh Ji starts off the Suraj Prakash explaining all the itahas that comes from the Suraj Prakash was actually written down by Sahib Singh while Gaur Singh was explaining it. They were seeing it with their divine eye and narrating everything that went on in the Guru's episodes. That was put into a form, and then he used that along with other narratives in order to write his uh, Guru Pratap. I don't know about Pai Mani Singhji. I've never known about Pai Mani Singhji being involved within the Guru Balas Pasha. That's me. Guru Balas Pasha Shemi, yes, Pai Mani Singhji's name comes up in that uh, because it's written by Bhagat Singh and uh, Kaviya Sorn Singh, who's there, while uh, Pai Mani Singhji is narrating everything. So I can't say anything about it. I can, you know, with regards to the text itself, I know it provides more than obviously the Gursoba or the Bichitra Nartak. Um, but that was because they were trying to elaborate on things that were missed out by those grants in the same way that um, the Pratin Panth Prakash focuses on stories of Sri Guru Nandir Ji that weren't within the Janam Sakhi because he says that I don't want to narrate those stories that have already been narrated because you can read those elsewhere. I believe that's the same with these grants, that they were trying to add on those things that were missed out. Um, I've not gone through the grant in a long time, to be quite honest. Um, There's one prominent part I have been through, um, because obviously I'm writing a text on Siri Guru uh, Tegwadaji's Bani at the moment. And one of the um, salogs you get within Siri Guru Tegwadaji's Bani is actually written down as Mahalla Dasan, was written down as Guru Gobind Singh Ji's salog. And the story within every other grant is that Siri Guru Dev Radhaji sends a letter to Siri Guru Gobind Singh Ji to test them. And Siri Guru Gobind Singh Ji writes the reply back, which makes up the saloks. But within the Gaur Singh's version of Guru Balas Pasha, it's completely different, where Guru Dev Radhaji is sat um, in their prison cell, basically, or um, in their confinement. And they focus on Siri Guru Gobind Singh Ji, who appears in front of them, and then they have that conversation there, and then they disappear again. 
which I, I found I found quite fascinating because I can't find it anywhere else. These conversations really help because they help provide so much more context to 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 these texts that a lot of us may or may not be quite familiar with. Just moving on then to the next one, Gurkia Sakya by Sarup Singh Koshish. It's held in high esteem apparently due to the information that it provides on events, dates, persons, and places in relation to the other ones. The the reason for that is because obviously Sarup Singh Koshish is. Um, a, a, a daily chronicler. That's what he is. He's a part, one of the part of his. So he is chronicling as day by day, supposed to be, you know, what's happening in Siddhi Guru Gobind Singh's life. I know people say it's held in high esteem. It's been released by Bihar Singh Padam again, so you can read it. For me, it's got one of the most intriguing passages in there, where it's the marriage of Baba Ji Singh Ji, Siddhi Guru Gobind Singh Ji's eldest son, Sarabjada. And obviously, uh, it talks about his son, Hutti Singh. So it says that uh, Bhai Ji, uh, Baba Ji Singh Ji gets married and has a son by the name of Hutti Singh. You do not find it in any other granth. You find within Sri Gopitha Suj Prakash that actually there are two Ajit Singhs. One is Sarajad uh, Ajit Singh Ji, uh, Baba Ji Singh Ji. And then obviously when Mata Sundari Ji goes to Delhi, she adopts a son, Ajit Singh, who has a son by the name of Hutti Singh. So for me, that was the big thing when I was looking into the book about the Sarab that I'm putting together as well. So for, for me, that was completely different because if you got a daily chronicler there saying that actually Siddhi Guru Gorman Singh Ji had their eldest Sarab Jada got married and had a child, are we looking at still a descendancy there from Siddhi Guru Gorman Singh Ji? I was just about to ask that. I was like, that's a really interesting uh, avenue because if there is, if that is true, which it kind of makes sense to be true if we're talking about a daily chronicler, like that's his that's his job. It does and it doesn't because you read within the Prachin, you read within the Gopartal, Sri Guru Gobind Singh, you said, when they, you get the, the incidents at Nana Devi uh, where Prakash of Akalpur in the form of what is considered to be the Devi happens, then my dad says... Even within their own body, that they would give everything to the Khalsa. So they gave, and they said they would give themselves to Chandi. Well, when they mean Chandi, they mean to the Shastra. So they gave their sons, they gave their father, and they gave themselves to a, you know, to a scabbard at Hajul Sahib as well. So what I'd say is Maharaj is butchering Aratel as well. So if you go with one story, you you take out the other. But just being devil's advocate, couldn't couldn't you couldn't you surmise that for argument's sake? And again, I don't know if this historically will will like make sense because obviously the age of Baba Ajit Singh Ji at his Shahidi. But if he had a child prior to Shahidi, then the Khalsa becoming Paragat and Maharaj giving everything to the Khalsa is technically still correct. There is, but the, the, the issue you have is right. The two only served that they go with Siddhi Guru Gobind Singh Ji. And you get the two youngest Sarabjad that go with uh, Mata Gujaji. The wives going with Baba Deep, uh, Pai Mani Singh Ji. You get, you know, uh, uh, you can see where Pai Chopa Singh goes, Pai Bajitra Singh goes. You can see where Uday Singh, Pai Jeevan Singh, Pai Kirpal Mahanti. You know, you can see where they give their shahid. You can see, who is the, what's the name of the wife? The, you know, such a big, a big part of the family. The one daughter-in-law of Sri Guru Gobind Singh Ji is left on her own. And to fend for herself, and nobody's with her, and nobody knows where she's gone or where this kid has gone. You know, that would have been chronicled. She would have been with the Hajuria Six, and they would have been surrounding her and looking after her, knowing that this is the lineage of Sri Guru Gobind Singh. That is a very good point. That's devil's advocate. There is, because I can't say for sure one thing is right, one thing is wrong. I can say that no other grants corroborate that in any other way. And I can say devil's advocate, if she was the daughter in law of Sri Guru Gobind Singh Ji, are you trying to tell me that nobody was with her? Yeah, and that would de- that def- that doesn't make any sense. No, I like that. I love these conversations. Thank you, thank you for being um for giving and taking as well. Because I think the the one thing is is you can the problem with a lot of this kind of intellectualizing is is if you want to see like if you want something to be true, you will make it true. And I, and I like the fact that in a lot of in actually all of the conversations that I've had so far with with yourselves and everyone else on the podcast is it's it's a very real sense of history it's actually like well hold on let's look at this let's look at this let's actually kind of see what the what actually happening rather than kind of pigeonholing it yes deductive reasoning like we said that's what you're doing aren't you, with everything no definitely definitely so then just moving on then from that then the next two that I wanted to ask you about were Mema Prakash or Sarup Das Bala and Bansfali Nama of Kesar Singh Jibbar what 
can you tell me about the the people and the texts? Right. There's to be honest with both of them. There's going to be very little I can tell you that other people are probably not told. But so I mean, obviously you covered it with Gomer Rupsi and Joel has done quite a lot of work on that with quotes. And th- um, I think the the main thing that everybody looks at in that is the Prakash of the two grants for a start. The explanation of the term Ganavar comes up in that and Dikka where it says that you, if you have a king, your eldest prince is considered to be a Dikka who's going to take over the rule. The other prin- princes are considered to be the Ganavar. So they are still princes, it's just they don't have the right to rule after the king goes. And they say that the Ganavar is basically the Dasam there. Um, but I've read that in a thesis. I'll have to find it for you. And then it mentions, obviously, that's where the term God comes from. The term God that's given to the signia is actually, they're not, it's not a princess, it's actually a prince. It's a prince who's going to, still the son of a king, but is not there to sit on the throne. Um, but I'll find you that book. It's a new new book and a new thesis that mentioned that. Uh, Ugrudanti is mentioned within there, the Bansalri Nama as well. But the thing that people despise about it is uh, Gisa Singh Shibra's lineage more than anything. He comes from a Brahmin background, three three descendancies before, three generations before, and people consider that to be somebody who's put in their Brahmin sort of uh, background or values within to something to do with Sikhi. But I'm pretty sure Gomalruk mentioned, and I'm sure you can correct me if I'm, I'm misquoting, but I'm sure Gomalruk mentioned that Gisar Singh Jibbar was Amratari Huzuri. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. He was, yeah, it totally was. But what they look at is again, he was Amratari, but three generations back, his family were Brahmins. And we believe that it's his Brahmin values from that background, his generations, his father's, grandfather's time, that are still influencing his writings. I don't I don't agree with that, but that's what people people saying that. Really refresh my knowledge on that. Memo Prakash was last time I went through that was with Deva Singh Nirmal, and that was 15 years ago, 10 years ago. But obviously, um, Siddhi Guru Amadashi's descendants, I've got a brand new thesis that's just come out on that, where the whole text has been written out in a digital format. Give me a couple of days and I'll post that up on there. Gurmuk Pichar, it's a really good thesis as well. So yeah, no, I'll, I'll get that up. But to be honest, I can't remember a lot within that grant, other than there's two Memo Prakashas. There's one, which is written in a um, poetical format. And then there's another one, which is Memo Prakash Vartak, which is just written like how the Parchia Parchai Dasmi is, where it's just written where you can just read it. You don't need to look for the, the metaphors and understand what the meaning is. So there's two out there. Okay, okay. That's interesting to, and good to know as well, because I wasn't aware of that. Just something that I wanted to, to I wanted to ask you, and, and because you mentioned Ugurdanti, it's, it's, it, it connects quite nicely. Someone sent in a question when I posted up that we were going to have this chat, uh, and they basically wanted to ask, so for argument's sake, obviously the Sodak Committee came to an agreement about which Baniya should be included in Dasam Grant, and Ugurdanti isn't included in most modern prints of 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 city dasam grant now their question essentially was are those again put just to put my personal opinion out first which is i don't i don't distinguish from any of it so as far as i'm concerned ugur than the still barney however the, the question from the individual was considering certain barney i were left out why was that the case and is that because is that simply because those the sort of committee at the time just thought it didn't fit whatever their criteria was, rather than it actually not being Barney? Interesting question for two reasons. One, if we the standardization of Barney within the grants, say we're talking about Sri Guru Granth Sahib Dasan, um, differ for two reasons. You know, we, we know the story why Sri Guru Granth Sahib is put into its composition and its order, and how it was by Sri Guru Arjan Devji. Um, the interesting thing at the time was obviously you only have one grant, which is a Kartarpur B, that looks the way it was, and then all the other grants at the same time that were considered uh, the grant side or the Ard grant looked very different because they had extra shabads in. The extra shabads of Sri Guru Nam Devji, different shabads of Surdas, different shabads of, you know, some of them had. Um, Shabbats of Mirabai, uh, Mirabai within there. There's a Ramkali Rag Shabbat of Mirabai within by Banoji's beer, the Ratan Mara Pran Sangli, all these things are put in there. So, Sri Guru Granth Sahib Beers, if you look at 
between the period of 1654 and I'd say 1720, the majority of the city of Grand Sauvage beers that you have have a lot of different body, you know, prior to standardization, prior to the sample of those in your Baba Deep Singes, by Money Singes, and people under their tutelage start writing the standardized beer. You used to have these extra beers with um, extra shepherds in, like, like I said, Mirabai's Ramkli Shabbat is within so much so that when you get to somebody like Gyani Gyansing who's commenting upon the different Bhagats within the city of Grand Sarge, he mentions Mirabai as being one of those Bhagats because you have all these glants that have all this. It's an easy reason why there's so many um, different types of uh, city of Grand Sarge up until that point, and that's you know, there was one bead. That was a Kartarpur bead. It was only given out to Pai Banoji to get binded. During that time, Pai Banoji copied it and added the extra shabbats. The original bead, which was a Kartarpur bead, became Prakash at Sri Harbandha Sahib. So the only bead that you could copy was Pai Banoji's bead. So you had a load of Sri uh, Guru uh, everywhere being copied from that with the extra shabbats in. Now, it's... It's never been detrimental in the case of City Guru Granth Sahib Ji because you then get the standardization done by the Guru themselves. And that's that's where the difference is. While the, the story that is always told during the Katha that we, we do when it comes to the Dasam Granth is that while Siri Guru Gobind Singh Ji were at yeah. Hiyakar, um in Nandir, they also went through all the arts of the Siri Dasam Granth prior to then doing the arts of the Sarbo uh, Grant uh, at Sarbo Bunga, which is Baba Nadam Singh Ji's Gurthana. So the issue we have is, if you could locate the original Dasam Grant that Guru Gurum Singh did the art from, then you could standardize it against that. Instead, what happened was, you had a number of people, a number of Sikhs who had portions of the Siri Dasam Grant. Obviously, by money, Singh Ji compiled it to the best of their ability. There were, like, Gurdanti, Pugaltiyas, the other, other bits of Bani that weren't within his um, rendition of the Sri Dasam Granth. So what happens is when you get the Sordak Committee, they do exactly the same as what takes place with, in Constantinople with Constantine in the 4th century AD, where they're trying to look at what needs to go within the Bible and what doesn't. And that's what causes the rift. So they look at, obviously they have their meetings between them, they have their conversations on what they assume should be within there and what they shouldn't. And at the same time, I think, I know it, it might not be the case, it's my personal view, they didn't want to make make the grant in size and volume bigger than the, the standardized city group grant subject as well. Because, you know, you, you don't have a volume... Uh, by Sri Gorbis Singh, who states that this is, this is my work, this is a play, you know, and they made sure, just because of Nimartha wise, that it was kept smaller. So when you get all the apocryphal Barneys, when you get the Sforta Kabit, and, you know, like you said, the Chand Shaka, you get yeah, the... Yeah, I've heard this a lot, and I've read this a lot as well, and that's that the reason why it's two pages uh, smaller, I think just due to Nimartha yeah. as well, they, they made sure that the, the size of the volume was kept smaller. Personally, for me, it makes absolutely no difference in my Sharda of the Golden Gita, the Ugardanti, the Bani, they're still a but And you see, especially with, you know, other than the Nahangs, the Nahang Singhs obviously keep that, the re, the readings of those Bani's going all the time. But the Namtaris do all the time as well. You go there and every morning the Ugardanti's read. You know, I think, they, they should, you know, it would have been different if we were able to locate or were able to keep hold of the Dasam at the time of Siri Guru Gobind Singh Ji at Hirakar that they did the cut off from. If we did that, then we could have standardized it according to that and gone, it's Guru Di Maul, it's done within the presence of the Guru and this is the one that we keep. Do we know what happened to that? No, I've, I've only heard it within the Katha. So again, if somebody was to ask me where it is or where can I locate it, unfortunately I don't. I, I can... You know, provide, you know, Gyan Tak Singh Ji's Katha, Sam Gurbachan Singh Ji's Katha, Sam Janel Singh Ji's Katha, Gyan Ibarbir Singh Ji's Katha, and there's Nirmalai Katha I've got as well within, um, where they're doing lectures where they talk about it, but nobody's able to actually say where it is or where it went. They believe it. 
Hajur Sahib, but uh, Dr. Sri Hajur Sahib, there's many different copies of Dasam from those times. I've left this question to, to, to after we've spoken about everything, because I think I think everything that we've spoken about adds a lot of content and context to, to, to this question. So you mentioned that a lot of the Vedantic texts are from a Zesira Panti or Nirmala perspective. For my own kind of research or whatever, I only kind of came across and, and started to research into these different sampradas once I kind of realized that modern day Sikhism isn't realistically what, what was being practiced back then and then it wasn't how it, as a community, how we coexisted. Now, we've already kind of discussed the, that age-old question of are, are Sikhs Hindus? And obviously it's very clear there's a complete distinct separation there's an evolution between one and the other. However, when we're talking about Seva Pantis or Dasis and Nirmali, the, the post Singh Sabha definition of what a Sikh is normally will exclude these people from that definition. What I would like, I guess, before we we, we go into the question of what makes those te- texts like Seva Panti perspective or Nirmala perspective is how do these Sampradas fit into the wider kind of makeup of Sikh history and, and where do they, I guess, originate from um, and what are their, like, what's their purpose? I'm just trying to think the best way to start. Right, the the Sampradas, the Odasis, Sevapanthis, and Nirmali. So the Odasis can show that their lineage comes from Sri Guru Nanak Dev Ji, then followed through Baba Sri Chanji. Their focus, they were the, originally the initial missionaries of the Sikh faith. If you look at it, you know, they had Gurdwaras or what they're called Taramsalas in Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, uh, Samarkand, and Tajikistan. Uh, you know, up until the point where you go to Azerbaijan to the Baku temple and it's got the Mool Mantra written on the Baku temple. So they, they took Sikhi all the way up to Russia, all the way into China, all the way into all, all those different places. They were very similar to how the early Buddhists were going from place to place. So, but at the same time, they kept Puranic elements. So where you get the difference between the Sivapantis Nirmala and the Adasis. The Adasis focus more on the Purans, which are the mythological stories within Hindu, uh, the old Hindu scriptures. So where you get what Guru Gorman Singh describes within the Chalbi of Thar, they focus on those sorts of things to do Gatha from and talk about, while the Sivapanthis and the Nirmala focus on Vedant. So what happens is, obviously, Baba Sri Chanji, they give the uh, lineage of the Adasis to Baba uh, Gurditta Ji, and then you get the four Turunir. And then you also get six Bakshisha. So, uh, by Sangatir, uh, Sutra Shah, uh, and four others, forgotten, Pagtamal, uh, I'm trying to think of their names, sorry, I forgot. But yeah, basically. Six Bukshisha, so six different orders, they give them, so from the seventh guru up until the tenth guru, they give Bukshisha to different individuals and say, start your own order. And they are all within the Adasi Sampurda. So they are basically your prominent missionaries that go serving place to place. If you read Pandit Tara Singh Narottam's uh, Gurtira Sangare, where he goes from different Gurdara to Gurdara, he tells you each Gurdara who was there, who was the Pujari. So he'll go, this one's got Nihangs, this one's got Nirmali, this one's got Odasis, this one's got Sevapantis. He explains to each one what the Gurdars are like, what goes on there, and who is in charge. So we know from books like that that they were in charge of some, some of the Gurdars. Sevapantis obviously come off uh, Paikaneyaji, their order starts from there. Also considered as part of the Sampurda within the um, Nirmali. I'd say they're distinct themselves, to be honest. They, they're mostly known as Odin Shahis from Paikaneyaji. And there's so many books and things on Payal and Shah's Jeevani. Uh, but he was a prominent one who mostly, if you look at what is the northwest frontier in Pakistan, you know, he focused or on or along that side. So you get within the Seva Panthi movement at the time, the translations of the Paris Bag, which is a 10th century text by Ghazali on alchemy, the alchemy of love. And you get Masnavi Pakha, which is the works of Rumi, which are translated as well. So you can see that they're looking for adherents and followers of in the Pushtun race and, the, you know, those sorts of areas to come into Sikhi. Uh, the Nirmali focus the other way. They go towards the east. They go more towards the east, towards Varanasi, Kanchi, places like that. So all these people were the missionaries of Sikhi at the time. Yes, there is, you know, I'll say with every single uh, Sampurda, they have a different take on things. But then my analogy of the Khalsa has always been the Khalsa is the garden. 
but each sampradaya is a different type of flower that's emanating a different fragrance that makes this garden a garden rather than a field. You walk through a field, it's one fragrance, while the glory of each different sampradaya is providing a different fragrance. Or the analogy of a, an orchestra, if you have an orchestra of one instrument, it just sounds like noise. You have an orchestra made of different instruments, it's a melody. And that's what the Karsa is, and that's what all the Sampradas bring. So what I, I look at is these old Sampradas still have a lot to give today, uh, rather than what we we were being... Like you said, when you grew up, and you're just like, I don't know about these things. And then you realise, Sikhi is more broader than it is being taught to us. And today, because of you know we, we're getting back through a time of ignorance, and slowly people are redefining what these Sampradas are. And like I said, within the school of Islam, when you get... To, they focus on, they say we should focus on the Batin. Don't focus on the Zahir. Because the Zahir is just on the, it's the outside. It's what is just the basic definition of something. Um, rather than focusing on the intrinsic definition. So the Nirmala Sampradas, Odasis, what they focus on is, this is what Gurbani says. But the true essence of Gurbani is actually saying this. This is where your soul needs to go. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to strive toward. And it's the focus on spirituality rather than appearance. Um, have you seen a series called Rami? Right, there's a great quote in Rami, and I I, I use it when it um, when I talk about Sikhi to anybody with in regards to the earth and spirituality. So, in Rami, there's a quote, and it says it says Islam is like an orange. There is an outer part and an inner part. If someone only got the rules and rituals, they might think that Islam is tough and bitter, like the outside of an orange. But there exists an inside, a juicy flesh of divine intimacy. This is a spiritual experience. The rind without the flesh is bitter and useless. The flesh without the rind will quickly rot. The outer sharia protects the inner spirituality. The inner spirituality gives the outer sharia its purpose and meaning. And that's the same with Sikhi. A teacher makes a person understand that you need both. Replace the word sharia with red and you're talking about Sikhi. And that's why you're talking about the normal in the Vedant. You're talking, you know, that's, that's fine. You can have the garb. You know, you look at somebody like by Udanchar, he wouldn't accept a garb. He said, as Siravantis, we're not going to adopt a garb like the Nirmale have, or the Adasis have, or the Nihangs have. He said, because good woman, he says, I guess I don't want people to focus on that. I need them to focus on the inner spirituality rather than the outer. So, yeah, so today, there's almost nothing on spirituality unless you go into these Sampradas. And for me, that's what really led me to um, looking at the works of these Sampradas. Because I, I got to that point where I was like, okay, that's fine, but what is this? What is this? What is this? What is this? And then you read, if, you, if anybody wants to know more about what we are as individuals, what is the real self? Within Sri Nanak Prakash, Rai Balad, on his last breaths, asked for Sri Guru Nanak Dev Ji to come to him. And Sri Guru Nanak Dev Ji arrives, and they speak to Rai Balad. And Rai Balad, and they, Guru Nanak Dev Ji have gone there in order to eradicate his final attachment to the world and make him one with God. And what they do is, uh, you know, Gurnanda Ji asked the Bible, do you know who you are? And he's like, yeah, I know who I am. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the body. And he's like, no, you're not the body. He's like, okay, I'm the, the five types of breath, you know, the five, the prana, prana, saman, vyan, udayan, you know, I'm, I'm these. Gurnanda Ji goes, no, you're beyond these. He goes, okay, I'm the, the five gosh of the body, the five sheaths. He's like, no, you're not these. He's like, okay, I'm the Antishka, and he goes, no, you're not these. Okay, I'm the the man, no, you're not this, you're not the body, you're not this. And it's the, it, that is Vedanta, that's what these old Sampradas teach, so like, these are essential, this is what you're looking for. You know, Gurnanda Ji has that conversation with Pai Lenaji before giving the Gaddi as well, to pass the jaw to them. Um, like I said, the Vichar of the Panjab Pasha and Shema Pasha within the Guru Pratap, go into these questions and answers with Sikhs. And as I said, I've spoken before, the fifth look of the Sri Guru Pratap, Surya Prakash, is probably the most difficult thing to read and understand. But if you want to know more about what the Nirmala and other season, the old Sampradas teach, that's basically it in a nutshell. One question that I just want to ask, from how you've been referring to the Nidamalays and the Odasis, the Sevapantis and the Nahangs, it seems as though you include them all within the within the term of Khalsa. The reason I, I like and and this the reason I put this question to you is so through some of the reading and the research that I've done is that there's always been this argument about kind of well there's always an argument about Sikh identity but just bringing it back to the to the question so there's always been this argument that there's Khalsa Sejdari 
case study and then there's this argument that a C and then there's the counter argument which is only Khalsa is C and then there's the other argument which is Nahang is Khalsa and then the Khalsa is Sikh so basically the most authentic version of the Khalsa are the Nahangs now I wasn't planning on asking this question but you but you you, you were referring to them all as part of the Khalsa now can you explain that understanding because to me that's a very new and fresh understanding and it makes a lot of sense um, but I just wanted to know more for me it's the basis of what Gurbani and Vedant says yeah, basically what it says is Vedant says that Maya is the illusion Illusion uh, is the thing that causes avaran and vikshep. Vikshep and avaran are the two qualities that cause mal, which is your hatred, your vices, your things like that within your body. To just look at someone and go, you are not part of this, is counterproductive because the essence of what Gurbani is saying is we are all essentially the same. Yes, there's an outer garb and an inner garb, but that, that's, that's different. Now, for me, all these sampradas were started under the tutelage of the gurus. Who am I to say that those sampradas are not relevant? That's it's only a personal view. I can't, you know, if somebody says to me, because I have heard it a million times, you, you, you know, minimally aren't. The hangs, uh, you know, they're not, uh, so they can't be part of the castle, or they're not you know, part of the castle because you save up on peace. And you go, well, hang on, you know, if that's the case, then Guru Gobind Singh Ji sent Veer Singh, Dale Singh, you know, Dale Singh, Ram Singh, you know, these five individuals under his guidance to, um, to Vanaras to go and learn everything, then come back. Then under the guidance of Pai Deya Singh and Pai Taram Singh, you get the 12 Sampardas and the 6 Sampardas, up Sampardas of the Nirmale break out under there. Pai Kanaya Ji was, you know, under Siri Guru Gobind Singh Ji. You're trying to find your... Kirpal Mahant Guru Gobind Singh Ji talks about this one Udasi within Bichitra Nartak during the Pagani Dajang. You know, again, if it, if it wasn't important, don't mention it. You know, they haven't mentioned other other individuals who we know were there. You know, we're talking about Bibi Viroji's five sons. You know, we know a couple, two of them were Shaheeds there. They mentioned them. They didn't mention Pai Budusha, Pekan Shah, and who's there. You know, for me, if the Guru has accepted them into the fold, then unless the Guru tells me that they're not in the fold, I'm quite happy to keep them there. But it's a personal view. I, I like that. I think that's a really nice way of explaining it. And to be honest, it makes makes sense as well, to be fair. Now, just the, uh, the last question on this point. Oh. Just a quick quick thing to ask. The armed forces, you, you look at the armed forces, whether you look at it in Gurbani, whether you look at it in anywhere else, even today. So the armed forces before used to be those infantry standing, those on horseback, those at the back, the, the cavalry, the archers, and those on elephants. And so they always said there's four types to the Sena. The, the four parts of the army make up the army together. If you send one type of infantry in on its own, it's going to get demolished. So you use the t- tactics. The Kansai is the same. You have your war- warriors, your intellectuals, those who do seva, and those who are the missionaries. You know, that as a collective, they work. Just the, uh, normally on their own, it won't work. Get rid of the Adasis, normally in the hunks, and just the, the normally. It's not the Kansai anymore. It doesn't work in the way it is. When the collective works together, just as when you put your fists together, each one of your fingers on their own, having got the ability to break anything, put your fingers together as a fist. And that's the Khalsa. That, that, that's a really nice way of putting it together. Just one last question then on, on, on this point. A lot of people argue that Baba Siddhi Chand was excommunicated from the Panth by Guru Nanak Dev Ji. I don't know anything about that. I've never actually read anything to kind of validate it or, or, or anything like that. But um, considering the Odasis are considered part of part and parcel of the Khalsa, what light can you shed on or what would you say to people who would argue that even? Well, the thing is, if, if that's the case... That's fine. You know, if if it's if people want to say, look, Baba Sri Janji was uh, excommunicated by Sri Guru Nandeji. Sri Guru Nandeji is a jyot that exists within the form of a Sargun Guru all the way up to Sri Guru Gobind Singh. So when we get DJ Pasha, oh, sorry, Jyoti Pasha having Baba Sri Janji uh, there in their presence, they're at Brambuta, which is now obviously outside Sri Hanuman Sahib, and uh, Sri Guru Ram Dashi in their Nimrta use their beard to uh, dust their feet. And then, you know, if they were excommunicated by Sri Guru Nandavji, the same jyot of Sri Guru Nandavji sat there in the, as the fourth guru, uh, showing their humility. Andrew Pasha, when they call everybody there for their gaddi, uh, it's Baba Sri Chanji there and the Adasis are there, they come later on when they send Pai Kamalaji. The, the distinction of the biddhis being excommunicated or the Adasis being Excommunicated doesn't make sense because within the Sri Gopratap, it states that every year 
the head of the Biddies or the Adasis was given a horse and 500 rupees. And you get that within the story of when Kamalaji comes to Sri Guru Arjan Dev Ji and asks for why the money hasn't been given this year to uh, Sri Guru, uh, from Sri Guru Arjan Dev Ji to Baba Sri Chanji. You get the story, obviously, of the sixth Guru with Baba Sri Chanji and Baba Sri Chanji say, I've not had a, a child or a son. You've got five sons, so give one to me. And they give their eldest one. You know, and Sri Guru Gobind Singh Ji, again, when they go to Baba Kalatari, who is the head of the Biddhis to give 500 rupees because they still continued on till that day. And Baba Kalatari says, you know, my, uh, Guru Gobind Singh says, why have you not joined the Khalsa yet? Why have you not taken Amrit? And they say, well, we've not had to all this time. You know, the Biddhis, we get given all this stuff. As the Adasis, basically, we get given all this stuff uh, from the, the, the Guru's house anyway. And then Guru Gobind Singh Ji says, no, take, take Amrit. So uh, Ajit Singh becomes a Baba Kalatari's eldest son who takes uh, Amrit. And then they say it will be his son that will have all the Shakti. Sari Shakti Alamalak over. And that is Baba Sahib Singh Ji Bidhi who ends up obviously um, giving, helping Maharaja and Ajit Singh Ji, Baba Bir Singh Ji, um, But if basically, if the Adasis were cut off at the point of Baba Sri Chand Ji, the same Jodh could have taken them back if they were excommunicated. But at the same time, if they were excommunicated, they never would have come near the Gurus again. And the Gurus would have never been in contact with them. They wouldn't have given them the 500 Mora every year, along with the horse as well. If, if, if there is proof out there, I'd like to read it. But from what I've seen, they continue on. And then you get the Baba Sri Chandji writing all the devotional grants in the name of Sri Guru Nandirji. Again, if you're excommunicated by somebody, you wouldn't really be revering them. Yeah, no, completely. To be honest, I think a lot of the um, argument for that suggestion is actually just from this um, idea that Udasis are Hindu and therefore they can't be part of like a Sikh tradition. Don't get me wrong. What, what's happened with the Udasis is since the marginalization, so whatever happened, the Udasis were Pujaris at one point, the caretakers of the Gurdwaras. And then we had the Saka at uh, Nanakana side take place where Lashman Singh was she. And obviously you had uh, Narayana who was the Udasi Mahant there who had caused all that trouble and he was an agent. That along with the, obviously the, the SGPC movement, when that came in, they said anything that is related to Sikhi as, as a Dira now comes under us. So the Udasis, unlike all the others, were quite quick and said, hang on, we've got all these grants, all this wealth, all this knowledge, we're going to be left without anything. So they then changed their, and they, they then changed their theory, said, yes, we follow uh, Baba Sri Chanji, but Baba Sri Chanji's guru was actually um, a Mahant guru of Anashi Muni from Kashmir, from Srinagar, who they studied under. So we're not actually Sikhs. And since then, they have marginalized themselves. And they in themselves, in order to not lose their property, their jamina, their, uh, you know, all, all the land and what do you call it, the treaties on the Gurdwari and the Guru cards like Brambuta and places like that, that don't go to the SGPC, is by saying they're no longer Sikh. That's what they did. That's what they've done. Because you talk to them now, and you know, they, they smoke, they do whatever they do, things that are completely different from what the Adasis used to do. And they said, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been to a couple of Adasi deals, I did a book on the Matras, and when spoke to them, they said, we had to do this. Otherwise, they said places like, um, um, you see the... Um, Report given by Baba Santa Singh Ji when they say the Akalis came to the Gurdwara, they poisoned all the, the water there, they killed all the people, and these are the people that we're trying to help. I'm not going to help them because they did a land grab of all the Gurdwara. My dad was at Redu Sahib within the 1960s, which was a Gurdwara where Baba Atta Singh Ji Redu Wale Santh stayed, did the Tapasya, and then Baba Isha Singh Ji learned from them and went to Dara Sahib. He was there when the Akalis came and took the Gurdwara as a land grab because they went, Guru Gobind Singh Ji stayed here for a few hours. And that was what was happening. Wherever the gurus or wherever the gurus had been to all these Adasi places, they tried to link it straight back to Sikhi so they could have a land grab. So the Adasis personal on, on purpose marginalize themselves so they could keep all their things. But they have caused themselves to be pushed out as well. Insane. I never quite knew that either. I like this. Um it's really helping to shed light on kind of the 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 more nuanced bits of history. Okay, so the next bit then that I wanted to talk to you about, which is mainly then to do with your translation works and actually how to be honest, like the biggest attraction for me was the fact that um 
provide like real definitions of Gurbani, but you obviously bring them into the English vernacular, which is super useful for people like myself. Um, and obviously a lot of people who are listening now, I'm going to ask like a series of questions because you mentioned when we were talking before that there's that there's a loss when a literal translation takes place um, as this loses like the real meanings, the questions being asked, to whom it's being asked, the context of it for argument's sake. So I think a really easy example would for argument's sake be Chitra Pakyan if you don't necessarily necessarily know the structure that it's being told in like between a king and his sons it can it, you, you can come to certain conclusions that that wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily get to if you if you knew the context now i just wanted you to explain a little bit more about the complexity of gurbani and how that works in terms of its form and structure because obviously it's extremely complex if there are these different perspectives and and different facets you have to take into consideration when translating it mm-hmm. The, the issue is, I, I realised it. I hit the age of 25, and I remember sat there with uh, one of my relatives, and I said to him, I said, by the end, by the time I hit 30, my uh, personal goal is to the whole of the Syrian ground soldier and memorise as many definitions as I could. So that was, stupidly, that was my arrogance. And I thought to myself, that's what I'm going to do. And you pick up a grant like Munmoor Singh's English translation of Syrian ground soldier, and you read it. And it says, as you, as you read in all of them, there is one God. He is the creator. He is, I was like, this is boring as hell. I was like, you know, this does not make sense. And I was like, why would Sri Nanak Dev Ji write in, in such a way of Ik or Ankar? Why would they write such a term when they could just put Ikarab and just leave it at that? And for me, it was, it was trying to figure out why certain things were done in a certain way. And it was only until I really started listening. You know, Gurmuk Bajaj was coming to a cusp, you know, it started in 2003, 2004. We had received the first two CDs of Santagiani Gurdwurst and Sinji's Gutha. And the first, you know, 30 or 40 MP3s were based on the Japji Circle. And the volume is, it's not great at all. I, I won't say it's, you know, even listenable, but I listened to the first MP3 at least about, I'd say, 100 times, without a doubt. And that was just the definitions of Ik Onkar. And it was at that point I realised that it was such a complexity within Gurbani that we weren't being told. So just the term Ik, you know, they defined the term Ik and explained it with six different meanings, you know, there's these things. And then they implied, here's the earth of Onkar. And then they gave it a car, a car, a car, one other than the pinta pehechan, charo ko sandai, jo on car pehechan. And you're like, well, where, where's this come from? And that's come from the Ram Gita. That's written in the Adatham Prakash. And for me, it was a case of why are these terms used? And it was only again when I hit the term Purk, something only good Western seems to give 27 different meanings for it. 27 different meanings and explain that Purk means uh, being, Purk means a sant, Urak, it means. The, you know, there's a there's a level of what we'd consider to be hell called and it's Rudak. Keep me safe, save me from this hell. You know, Purk. So it's like Staria Puriada Ke Karnola, the person who d- destroys all the domains. And then you realize you're just like, actually, Gurbani is more complex as it is. And what's been happening is we've had a watered down basic level approach where somebody looks at a term and goes, right, the Akaran. This term means this. That is the one definition. And they're not going through what I found with these things is Gurbani needs an Atanika, which is a preface. You have Sakya that go with it. Gurbani has Padarth, which is a basic art, like I just said. You have the Antrivart, which is an intrinsic art. Anave art, which is where you put the words in a different order, or you, you do the definition of a second line before you do a first line. You have Kandak art, where you break the, the line in two. A dundak arts, which is the one line, but you put it before another one. Gurbani is so complex, and it's only when you start going into the Sampradayak Katha that you realize that what I've been reading in English translation is not Gurbani. It is just a basic translation of a text, which is no different to the first book I read by Max Arthur Malkoff. It's exactly the same. It provides me with no essence. Just a quick question on, on the translation stuff. One thing that I... I'd learned whilst I was doing my research in the Sing Samba movement during my dissertation was that very quickly what the British started to do was educate Sikhs within within English vernacular schools in India. And would you argue then that a lot of the translations that most people are using in the world, especially the English ones, are actually just 
the reason we're getting to these incomplete translations is because we are actually using like the wrong perspective and the wrong lens. Like we're still being educated in that Western framework and that Western mindset, which doesn't appreciate for argument's sake all the different arts that you've mentioned of how you read Gurbani. Exactly. They don't they apply it with a singular sense of this is exactly the same as me looking at um, the works of Ferdoshi or, you know, uh, somebody like that, where you look at the Persian uh, Shahnama and you go, it's just word for word. They don't realize that there's a deeper m- meaning to, you know, the, the other thing you have is that it's not just the British, it's today's scholars as well are sat there and implying that if I just do the definition of this, I, I agree that what a lot of people are doing is they're using the, the early translations, like I said, people still use Malkus translations, which are oh, word for word as a definition, but they don't give you any anything more. You, you know, they don't look at the intrinsic. They don't look at the. They don't look at the grammar. You know, so say we start with Gonago bin the guy or he, you know, it, within Sigur Tegwadji Sloks. So obviously that line is always interpreted. If you don't meditate upon the name of God, then your life is wasted. But at the same time, they don't realize if you recite it, it's going to go up in the guy Nehi Janama Garat Keen. So if you meditate on the name of God, your life is not wasted. So they look at just one answer all the time. Uh, have you got my book on Nana Prakash by Gyani Harpajan Singh that I translated? Within that, I've written a, there's a passage that Gyani Harpajan Singh explained, and they state that people don't realize that Gurbani has many different definitions. So there's a show with my point of Kabirji on page uh, on 477. Obviously, Grand that has about five or six different definitions. So the show with this uh, starts off feeling Rabbi Balad Pakavaj. And um Point of Kabirji sat there and they have an individual who states that he just wants to have a talk to with Suguru um with Point of Kabirji and just says tell me about something. You know, he was a simple man uh, stated he'd gone to a wedding you know, he, he wanted to know something. He's just like, just talk to me. Tell me about something that's, that's strange. So, what can we do? Tell him about this and say, look, feel the Rabbi, Bullet Bukhavaj. So he says, I went to a wedding where there was an elephant playing the in- musical instrument known as a Rabal, while the bull was playing uh, a tabla with its horns. So you read that whole Shabbat and it doesn't make sense because all these animals cannot do this sort of thing. So it basically says this simple man was quite intrigued. He had not heard of such a marriage ceremony. He goes off. And then as soon as he leaves, an individual comes who's a seeker of knowledge, and he's like, you know, tell me about my mind. Um, no, he asks Pukwiji, he says, tell me about how your state of mind was previously and what your state of mind is now. And Pukwiji then recites the same show with the same, again, says, feel the rabbi, but the He says, my mind was restless previously like an elephant. That would be restless. That restlessness has now changed. It is now focused and praises on God. The mind used to be lazy like a bull. Uh, the bull is now playing the tabla in praise of God. My mind now wakes up early in the morning and meditates on the tabla, praising God. And then again, he goes through the Shabbat, explains it all, and then the individual goes away. And at that point, a, a third person comes and asks Bhagavad says, when the Brahmanis leave this world, who comes to give them honor and respect? You know, with normal people, it's the angels of death that take them, but who gives them respect? And Bhagavad then recites it again, says, Fila Rabbi Bhadat Pakavaj Gawa Tala Bajala. The one who rides upon an elephant is known as Inder. And when a Brahmanis leaves this world, he along with his 330 million deities come and meet him. The one who plays a Rabab is not of the money. He also meets the Brahmanis. The female deity who plays the symbols. She comes to meet the Brahmagyani. Shiva, who rides a bull, also comes to meet the Brahmagyani. And that's what I found so fascinating about Gurbani. I couldn't believe that there was definition after definition after definition for the same line. Uh, and, and what we're having today in English translations is just the basic definition with no understanding of the context of spirituality that, uh, or who this teaching is being given to. Uh, and that's why I try to produce the translations that I do. I'm listening to Gatha as, I, uh, as it's being narrated in the audios. And like I do with my day-to-day job, I, I'm quite happy to transcribe interviews that I need for court. So it's no different for me. I get home, I listen to Gatha and narrate it as it is. There are two last questions that I that, um, that were sent in actually by by. Uh, members of the community so the first one is well, who and i would argue that you're probably going to find this one quite difficult because i assume you've listened to so much kata um you've got a number of them but who is your favorite kata vachak and why believe it or not kata is exactly the same as playing a rag 
So when you're playing a rag, you're playing a rag based on what your mental thoughts are at the time. If you're dispassionate, you know, if I'm dispassionate, I'll play a Ghana rag, Shabbat. If I am happy, I'll play an Asa rag, Shabbat. If I'm, it, because what that does is the Katha is in tune with your intellect at the time or your, your mental disposition at the time. And it's, you take in more. So if I'm if I want to sit there and just listen about divine knowledge, and I just want to hear the voices that resonate w- with what I conceive to be God's voice, you know, something I'm going to watch the Sunday Prayer. always top of my track list, uh, you know, when I'm got my um, MP3s on. Gani hurpa just singji two di koi wale. There's no second to them at the moment. My style, Santhari singji. If I'm feeling dispassionate, Santhari am singji. If I'm in in one of those moods where I just want to reflect on what's happening. So it depends on the mood I'm in. It's really weird. It's not a case that I can just listen to the same kataka all the time. It depends on what mood I'm in. It might sound strange to somebody, but that's how I am. If I'm if I'm reflective, I want to just, I've had enough of the day and I want to listen to something dispassionate. You know, I'll pick somebody's, the ones on Pai Manj or something like that. It depends on what it is. Saying. No, no, fair enough. I guess it's kind of like asking someone what's your favourite kind of music and they're like, well, actually, I listen to everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, I listen to everything, you know, depending on if I if I need to work out, I never work out, by the way. Uh, I listen to some dance music, you know, or if I'm in an angry mood, I listen to some, some hip-hop, some gangster raps or whatever. If I'm in a mood where I just want to reflect, I'll have some indie music on. It's exactly the same. And Katha is exactly the same because the whole purpose of Katha is the Katha is supposed to be relaying that message to you in such a way that you feel it. If you listen to something that you're not feeling at the time, you won't take it in. All right, there's the last question then. This one is kind of a bit of a random one, but uh, someone asked, is there any way to download everything off the website in one go? I would assume it's too large to do that, but... Um... Yeah, unfortunately, what would happen is nobody's computer will be able to say that. And if somebody was trying to download the whole site, it just means the data that are being downloaded there would consume all the bandwidths, not allowing anybody else to get anything. It would just crash the service. My, my big issue with that is why does somebody need to download everything? Because I would like to find the one individual who has listened to the Sri Guru and Sarji Katha of Samgir Gurbachar Singh, the Dasam Katha of Gani Harpan Singh and the Sri Guru Katha of Gani Harpan Singh, and maybe the Pant Prakash Katha by Gani Manjit Singh Ji. I, I don't think I'll ever find them because nobody's got that sort of time. I've got I've got another two terabytes of data to put up in the next couple of days. I've got another 10,000 recordings, but I've got another 40,000 recordings to put up. So there's, you know, there's there's too much. What what I prefer is somebody to listen to what they're feeling at the time. Take two or three Qatar downloads. You listen to that Qatar guy, you go, I'm not feeling that. Pick another one. If somebody tries to download everything, then they're, they're going to have too much there that they're never going to use. And that's what I find with PDFs. People love PDFs. They want everything in PDF. If you ever ask them, you're like, right, you downloaded that PDF. What did you make of it? I've not read it. Yeah, yeah, everyone wants a collection, but they don't actually want to spend the time. No, fair point, fair point, fair point. This is just actually a question out of curiosity. Um, Out of the PDFs you have and out of the Qatar that you've got and, and the audio, sorry, that you've got on the website, for someone who has a really basic understanding of Punjabi, which Qatar would you point them to first and which PDFs would you point them to? I would, even though I've been dissing it just in the last one. I'd start with your basic books like your Cunninghams, your Malcliffs, your, your bits like that. That's what I have to start with. Basically, when it comes to understanding Gurbani or getting to that point where you understand all the Gatha, I believe you have to move through that spiritual stage that's said within um, Jabji side where it's Gurmukh Nadan, Gurmukh Vedan, Gurmukh Reswai. So initially you start with Girtan. You start with Girtan, you start resonating with Girtan, then you start on your basic Kathas. So I'd start with your you know, Gani Thakur Singhji's Katha of Sri Guru Granth Sahib Ji, that's quite basic, that's straightforward. Um, basic Kathas on Sikh, the Haas from Pai Pindar Pal Singh. Um, and then, like I said, the PDFs, like I said, your traditional, your first British ones, I'd start with those before you get into anything uh, even written by myself, I'd say, before you start on any of those, you've got to start on the basic ones. So, yeah, Gani Thakur Singh, I'd say, that's the easiest Sri Guru Granth Sahib Ji Katha. Very basic. Very straight to the point. No second meanings, third meanings. Very basic stories as well. That's where I'd say anybody should start. No, no, thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, that was it. That was really interesting. Thank you so much for 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 going through it in so much depth um, and breadth. As always, I have to say thank you to yourself for spending the time to do this podcast, and also to anyone who's made it to the end of this podcast. Thanks for listening.